call the meeting of the Cleveland Heights University Heights Board of Education to order. Mr. Gaynor, would you call the roll? Mr. Coble. Here. Ms. Pepler. Here. Mr. Register. Here. Mr. Silverman. Here. Mr. Zucker. Here. We have uh, a couple of meetings tonight. One is our regular organization meeting on the first meeting of each year. And the first order, and then after that, we'll have a regular board meeting when we'll take statements from the audience and have other kind of business to take care of. So first, we're going to do the organization meeting. And the first item on the agenda is the election of board president for 2015. And I'll open, accept the nominations for that position. I have a nomination. I would like to nominate, I need to do oh. this, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I would like to nominate Nancy Pepler as president of the board. Okay, Nancy Pepler's name is in nomination. Are there any other nominations? <coughs> sorry. Okay, then the nomination is closed. Um, the way we vote is that we would call the name of the, of the person that we are, we would vote for for president. Mr. Gaynor, would you call the roll? Mr. Coble. Nancy Pepler. Ms. Pepler. Nancy Pepler. Mr. Register. Nancy Pepler. Mr. Silverman. Nancy Pepler. Mr. Zucker. Nancy Pepler. <laughs> then Nancy Pepler has been elected board president. Thank and you. I can give the gavel to her <laughs> and let her move here and I can move there. there you go. Okay. So I appreciate everybody's support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks, Ron. You've, you've done a great job the last two years as board president. I, I appreciate all of your support. Welcome. Okay, next um, item of business is the election of the board vice president. Do, can I have a nomination from the... F I board. nominate Ron Register. Any other nominations? Mr. Gaynor. Ms. Pepler. Ron Register. Mr. Register. Ron Register. Mr. Silverman. Uh, abstain. Mr. Zucker. Ron Register. Mr. Coble. Ron Register. Okay, thank you. And next is the ap appointment of the treasurer pro tem. Um, and this is the person who handles um, Mr. Gaynor's duties when he's unable to join us for, um, for the meetings. Um, would anyone be willing to volunteer to serve as uh, treasurer pro tem over the next year? Mr. Zucker, thank you. I don't you can care. Take it if you I, don't, I think I, Scott I, would prefer I, you to do it. I don't care. I'm taking skills. I've never done it. I saw him doing this. He might have been pointing at you, Eric, <laughs> but we're going to make Cal. I was, Al Zucker. <laughs> I, was just, I was just floundering. Do we do we, we do a full vote for that? Um, for that, we do not. We don't. No. Okay, because it's not an election. Correct. Okay. Um, next order of business is to set the dates of the regular um, board meetings. And um, I and should just actually, read this. Well, you can actually take all those organizational items. Oh, all of the rest as, of them. Okay, so together. so items um, four through thirteen, I can take go together. Ahead, go ahead and take three through thirteen with Mr. Zucker. Oh, actually. okay, three through thirteen, including Mr. Zucker as treasurer pro tem. Can I have a motion to approve all of those items together? That way, it'll go more quickly. Second. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Register. Yes. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Mr. Coble. Yes. Ms. Pepper. Yes. <coughs> okay, so that was fast. You didn't have to be scared that we said we were having two meetings tonight. Right. <laughs> that was our first meeting. We have to do it at the beginning of each year. And so now we're moving on to our regular board meeting. Um, and first, we will. We don't need to do roll call again. We'll move into awards and recognitions. Okay, Superintendent Dixon. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Hello. So, before I begin the meeting, I would like to recognize one of our outstanding technical programs and also honor our board members for their service. <coughs> I'll begin by congratulating the Heights High Auto Tech Program on receiving national accreditation. 
their new cer certif certification from the National Institute for Automotive Service Excellent applies to both the program and the facili facility. The evaluation in October considered 10 areas of the program, including instruction, equipment, and co-op work agreements. This means that the students in this program are now eligible to receive the G1 High School Auto Technology Certification. From there, they will be ready to enroll in a technical college or go straight to the workforce. There are currently 14 juniors and 17 seniors enrolled in this program. I would like to present the certification certificates rather to Auto Tech instructor Jeff Porter, if he would come forward. Uh, Mr. Porter, who is the AS, let's give him a hand. Thank you. He is an ASE Master's uh, Certified Technician and Instructor, and. Um, we have two students, Michael Hancock and Elias Ali. And you will come and receive your um, certificates, and then we we'll take a picture. So you want them here? Gotcha. Thank Just you. That. Just this one. Okay. I read it. So we're going to give this to Mr. Porter. You can hold it. Thank you. And the students want to get them to, and they will come in the front, please. We get a picture. And the president. Okay, next, I'd like to recognize our board members. So January is the school board recognition month. So during this month, board members are acknowledged for their tireless work that they do for the students and the overall community. To each and every one of you, the board members of this district, I appreciate what you do and what you've done for this community. The tough decisions that you make affect our children and our community. The policies you've established provide the important framework on how our public sc schools function. You have a great task before you this year. I want to salute you, Nancy Pepler, Eric Coble, Ron Register, Eric Silverman, and Kyle Zucker for your dedication and hard work ahead. I applaud you for being visionaries and leading your voice to our schools to help shape a better tomorrow. Please come to the podium and accept your certificates from the Ohio School Board Association. And then please move to the front so we can uh, be recognized and receive your uh, plaque and we take a photo. So come on, everyone. Let's give them a hand. They worked so hard. Okay. Okay, so that concludes the uh, recognitions for this evening, and we can go to the other um, items. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Um, we don't have requested audience, but we have quite a few um, people who have signed up to make statements from the <coughs> audience. And so when I call your name, um, please come forward to the podium. You have five minutes. We will give you a warning if you get close to that five-minute mark. And we would appreciate that you uh, help us to move the agenda forward by sticking to that. So thank you. First, we have Lillian Moore.
that's fine. If if Po Trotsky, you'd like to speak first, that's fine also. Actually, would you mind just passing one of those out? To, yeah. Um, this is incredibly humbling here. I did not expect this, nor did I ask, but uh, I guess God has a plan in general. Um, first thing I want to do is I want to thank the board, all the small school principals, Ryan Lorette's the head of security, all the past superintendents and assistants that have been incredibly uh, kind to me, and the greatest athletic director in the country who gets it, what we stand for. I want to thank you guys and Ron on the first interview for allowing me to, to mentor these boys to become young men. When I took this job eight years ago, I was told how bad these kids were. I was told everything in the world that they wouldn't do, couldn't do, they won't study, they won't work hard, and you'll certainly never win at Cleveland Heights. Well, you tell that to the future Dr. Bodea Gaja. You tell that to Brown University graduate All-American Emory Polly. You tell that to Shelton Gibson, who people said would be dead or in jail, and oh, by the way, got a 3.6 at West Virginia this past year. Now, I, I know um, the furthest thing from perfect. Ask my wife and my son who are here, they'll tell you. The one thing I know I am is that I'm my word. And everything I told you, gentlemen, that I would do and ladies that I would do, and loving these young men, I have done. I live a pretty simple life. I've got a career. God has blessed me to be a little bit successful. I have a family I love more than life itself. Son is 16. My daughter's 12. Incredible wife. I work at my job. We run a mentoring program. I've been doing it for 23 years in the heart of the inner city of Cleveland. And I coach and I mentor young African-American men in adverse areas. I'm not a drinker. I'm not a partier. I got a simple life. God's plan for me is always to go, on, to, go to underserved areas and try to do the Lord's work there. In over eight years, we've won a lot of football games here, and I'm proud of that. But it really doesn't matter in the big picture. What matters is what I put in front of you. When people ask me what my record is, I don't talk about, hey, we're 150 and 26. I talk. I talk about our tree, our tree of success. The kids that never had a chance, that people told me would never have gone. I'm not only gone to school, but our kids graduate. We nurture these young men through a lot of love. There's two kinds of love. There's tough love that many of our kids need. And there's also the kind love with a lot which happens behind closed doors. That's not done for image. It's not done for any other reason. But a lot of our young men who come from single moms know and appreciate because they need that in their lives. We have grown so many young men of character that it makes me so proud when all of them come back. If any of you happen to be around last week on vacation or a week to, to just prior to last week, you saw 40 kids on the stadium, 10 of them alumni, Marcus McShepard from Northwestern, Shelton from West Virginia, Powell from Edinburgh, worth 40 of our kids for four hours. Not because they had to, because they want to be with our kids. They feel that responsibility in a positive way to come back. That's what we breed. That's what we've taught, the loyalty. They have learned to be loyal to people, not to bricks and mortar. And seeing our young kids emulate them makes me very proud. 
Now, I've been here eight years with a very loyal staff. Many have been with me for over 15 years. They love these boys the same way as I do. Our program is based on GF, GF. It's on every T-shirt. God or generosity, family, grades, and football. Over two years ago, I knew I was going to have an issue down the pipe because I knew my son is a blessed young athlete and that there would be an issue somewhere down the road. So knowing, and I say we got the best doggone athletic director in America, let me reiterate that, that we saw this in advance, and that's why this year we started playing our games on Saturdays. She valued and understood the importance of the family side. I was open and up front, she understood, and I've been open and up front with our kids all along. <clears throat> I'm here tonight to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for these eight years, but also to pose one question, and then I'll be out of your way. Does the eight years of love and dedication and the, and the sweat and tears and the just genuine affection we have for these young men allow me one favor? You haven't seen me in front of this board before, have you, Ron? I haven't come to you to, to ask you anything, right? I have two years. My son will be a junior and a senior. That I need to play our home games on Saturday afternoons. That's all I ask. We already have a couple of them scheduled during those times as well already. But I got to be a dad too. I need to be a father as well. And I would hope if there's anything that this community stands for, it's about families as well. <coughs> there are many other reasons besides the fact that it'll help me, but we have a new beautiful building that's going to go up. All the security folks and the police have all said it'd be much safer in our venue to play on Saturday afternoons anyways much safer, God forbid, if something were to happen and it's dark and no place to go. I know I'm going to have to miss some of my son's games in general. I can, I got to live with that as a father. But I'm willing to do that because these are my boys. These are my boys. These are my boys. So Eight years ago, we started this, and I'll leave this here for you all. It's the first T-shirt I ever bought our kids. No, no, no. The legend on Lee Road, the story begins. People didn't think there was going to be a story. They thought it'd be a quick ending. If I'm able to continue on as his head coach, I'll gladly take it back from you tomorrow, Ron. If I can't, I will always bleed black and gold. I will always love my guys. God bless the Tigers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Coach. Um, I did obviously let Coach Rodsky um, go for longer than five minutes. Um, that obviously was the right thing to do, and that's what, why a lot, if not the majority of you, are here. Um, but I will ask the rest of you when you come forward to, to stick to that five minutes. We have a lot on the agenda after public comment this evening. So, um, Ms. Moore, would you like to come forward? I'm here to support Coach Roski. Coach Roski has showed me out of one year that he loves these kids. My son, this year has been his first year playing football for Roski. My son has told me if Roski goes, he's going. <coughs> my kids are begging me to stay in this district after I have been through hell and back with my ex-husband. Roski has been there to support me through thick and thin throughout the whole process. He has been getting on my son. I don't care what he, words he used to sit up there and get through my son. He can use hell. He can use get your ass over here. Do what you're supposed to do. Because of the fact that as long as he's not calling my son out of the names that I have heard from previous coaches, I don't give a damn what he says to my son. Flat out because of the fact that he's going to sit up there and love my son, and he's going to sit up there and give him the hardcore that he needs to sit up there and be successful in this district. I asked um, 
Dr. Johnston, why is my son failing Please. one class? No, I'm not coming down. I'm not. No, I'm because I told you all last year that I am done being nice. I'm done. I came to this daggone meeting two times asking why my son is failing. He's on an IEP. Why is he failing? Two classes. Ms. Moore, you know no, I'm not coming down. I'm not. No, I'm not coming that. down. I'm not. Because this daggone coach has shown my son love and respect way more than what anybody in this other district has. If Marvin K. Jones tell me the truth, when I raise hell, I raise hell, don't I? You know me from Wardsville. When I raise hell, I raise hell for a reason. It's because my son's grades, as well as that he's been, he's been more active in this district as he ever been in any other district. I homeschool mine. I'm going to advocate for mine, as well as these other kids. Okay, I can't read the first name, last name Dodson. Corey? Was it Corey? Okay. Thanks, Corey. How y'all doing? Good. Uh, y'all don't know me. Uh, y'all probably know my little brother. Uh, his name's Kyle Dyson from Ohio State. That's my little brother. Uh, y'all don't have to clap for that. I ain't nothing. <laughs> um, but no, nah, um, I came up here today. I, I'm, oh, by the way, my name is Corey Dyson. I'm a senior at the University of Akron. And uh, Coach Roski, it's hard for me to start. I don't know really where to start. But uh, I know y'all have power, and I know I just want to – I want anybody – if anybody want to hear, I want Coach Rasky to hear. Uh, uh, a lot of people don't know, in middle school, uh, me and my little brother, we lost our mom. Uh, Coach Rasky is, is more than just Coach Rasky. He's, 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 if, if Cleveland Heights loses Coach Rasky, it's not just any school leave, losing a coach. Y'all losing a, a great man that does things more than the football field. But, uh but before my little brother became the All-American, before he got all the scholarship offers, before anybody knew, thought me or my little brother were anything, Coach Rossi came to our house on Christmas, eighth grade year. I went to Roxborough. He came with, with Travis Kelsey, who plays for the Chiefs now, and like five other seniors, and they brought us Christmas presents just because he cared. We didn't even play football for Cleveland Heights yet. He just did that out of the kindness of his heart because he cared about us. Coach Rossi cares about this community. He cares about... African American males, any any other, it doesn't matter the race. He cares about Cleveland Heights kids, and he wants to see us do good. It's not just about football. Everybody thinks it's about football and all of that, and even the grades. It's about the grades too. Yes, grades matter, but it's about life. My father was never around for us. I have my grandfather and my grandmother that raised us, but Coach Roski is a father figure for me. Coach Lemons is our father figure. Oh, the rest of the coaching staff, he's there. If I need anything to this day, I can call Coach Roski. I have two roommates at the University of Akron. One went to Euclid and one went to Twinsburg. I, I, I talk all the time about Cleveland Heights football. Coach Rossi, this. I asked him about that. They can't call their head coaches from high school for anything. And people take it for granted like it's a TV show. I, I took it for granted, too. I thought everybody, I'm looking at them crazy. Like, I'm thinking everybody, you can call your head coach from high school for anything. But I, I see that reality. It's not like that. But we have that at Cleveland Heights. We have a really, really good man at Cleveland Heights. I, I looked online. It was Wikipedia, so I don't know if it was true or not. <laughs> but it said, it said Cleveland Heights was founded in 1901. <laughs> but we haven't made the playoffs in the history of Cleveland Heights. When he got that shirt, this shirt that says the legend on Lee Road, I was in the eighth grade. We were about, I was about to go to ninth grade. People laughed at us. That was a, that was a joking matter to say Cleveland Heights would be a legend of anything. That's why it's like when I heard about a new principal, I was like, he doesn't, he doesn't know the history of Cleveland Heights. He doesn't know the history of, of Cleveland Heights and what Cleveland Heights means. <laughs> to, growing, growing up, saying, if, you, if you told anybody I play for Cleveland Heights, they'll laugh at you. You don't get that now. We have, we have multiple, multiple Division I college athletes, either in the NFL or on the way to the NFL, about to graduate doing big things, and it's all because of Coach Roski. Yeah. Think how many head coaches have came around. Think how many people, mentors, have come around since 1901. And we couldn't do these things. He took us to new, new heights, new levels. 
And I think for it to for it all to end over something so insignificant as games being played on a Saturday, his, his son, ba the Bailey Roski, the one we're talking about, we used to do workouts, wor working all the time. He was like this tall, doing workouts with his running ladders, with his doing all that. And you telling me that this kid who was giving his all since he was like eight, can't, can we, his dad can't come watch him play? I, I just, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. So, I mean, it's, it's more stuff. And I, I wrote, I, I wrote down little notes. And I, I had to come back from Akron, so I really didn't write anything down. But it's just so much I wish I could say. And I know y'all have power. If it's anything y'all can do, from the bottom of my heart, it means a lot to me. And my little brother sent me a text message. I'm not even about to read it out. But it means the bottom of my heart from, from me and my little brother. And I think I speak for every. A student athlete that ever has ever walked the halls of Cleveland Heights, Coach Roski means a lot to us, man. Don't take my coach, please, man. Thank you, Corey. You did a nice job for not having written it down. Um, Keom, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not saying this correctly. Keom Sims, Keome Sims. You can correct me when you get up there. I've never seen that name. <laughs> I just want you to. Come Everything's closer already to been the mic said. a little. Okay. I, I, I said my car went over what I wanted to say because what Coach Rossi did, did for my son, you can't even see. <coughs> my son is a smart child. You know, and he doesn't really have any disciplinary problems but I needed my son to grow up to be a man. You know, my son, my oldest son went to St. Ignatius. Wonderful education, senior advisor, 28. He's outstanding. But so is Michael, but Michael needed something more than just being a smart student. He needed to learn how to be a man, not only a man, a leader of men. And I listened to Coach Roski when he was coming up to eighth grade. He's the only child in my household went to a public school because of Coach Roski. And he started his growth of being a man and a leader of men, which Coach Ali, and I have to laugh, because my son changed <laughs> when he met this man. And I say hello to him all the time because they don't know what the impact they had on my son. They help him grow up to feel confident in himself so he can go on and be part of this world, not just being a man who's functioning, but be a leader of men, like my son who went to St. Ignatius. That's why my son is here at Cleveland Heights with Coach Roski. I went to Cleveland Heights 40 years ago. And before I came, they were in, uh, I think, with the Luke magazine. Cleveland Heights was in the top 10 in the nation. <clears throat> and we can't say that now, but we have a top 10 man here. My husband never, ever called and complained about my son. He's a sportsman. He saw Coach Roski. The minute, Coach Roski had never seen my husband, but he understood his technique. He understood what he was doing for our son. And you can see it. Someone said, don't go in there blindly. I'm not here blind. It's in my son. He changed. He's growing up because of Coach Roski and his coaching staff. I, I, I just think it's ludicrous that you will take someone who's already an all-star in the public school and take them away. When you think of Coach Roski, you think of other big coaches like from St. Ages, Glenville, they're top notch, St. Edwards, and there's our public school coach Roski there, giving them top quality lessons in life. And you want to take that away over minor little things? You want, I thought our children came first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we lose the sight of that. So I have to sit down because I'm going to start getting emotional because I cannot believe after I bet I passed so many opportunities for my son to have a better education and bring him to heights because I know he can do it. He's AP. He's honored. So he don't got the 4.2, but he's well-rounded. That Harvard ones, Brown ones, they want a well-rounded kid today. They just want kids with good grades. 
Coach Ross and his team is making my son well-rounded. And I want to say thank you to that. I want to say thank you to Coach Roski and his football team coaches, wherever they are, because you helped my son to become a man. And he is going to be a leader of men because of you. OK, um, next we have Veronica Wimberly. <laughs> First of all, I want to acknowledge God, who is definitely the head of my life. All right? My name is Veronica Wimberly. The reason I would really like to speak about Coach Roski is, number one, my son's name is Rayshawn Dickerson. We come from New Jersey. When I met Coach Roski, I didn't know what to expect from Coach Roski. It was a challenge for my son because of where we came from. Just to acknowledge that he took the time out for my son, just as well as everyone here I can speak for, every child in here got the same type of tough love. It was called tough love. We can all sit back and say that we want our kids to be men. But one thing I learned about Coach Roski with my son is how to respect himself because without respecting himself he can't even respect others me and coach Roski a lot of times didn't see eye to eye a lot and I didn't understand a lot of things that coach Roski did my son now is at Charleston University in West Virginia at a D2 college so forget about how I felt about Coach Roski. He did what he was supposed to, to, to allow my son to do what he need to do. Do I feel like my son could have been at a D1 college? Absolutely. Does Coach Roski feel that my son should have been at a D1 college? Absolutely. But it wasn't just Coach Roski. As much as Coach Roski put into these young men, he also asked them to put in the same as well. We sit back and we look at all these parents that came out to support Coach Roski. He is a wonderful, amazing, not only coach, but a teacher, a leader, an inspiration. And one thing I do love about Coach Roski, in every sentence that he say, God is always number one. What, and I know in God's willing, Anything is possible with prayer. They say if more than one come together, we can move mountains, okay? We can move a lot of things in here together. But it's just sad to see on this occasion that how we sit back and say that we want to support our family. I don't think that it's fair why he can't support his family, just like they said. He should be able to be allowed to be at his son game, just like he support our kids. He support our kids, so he should be able to have the chance to support his own as well. We should be caring, understanding, and willing to sit back and do whatever we can to make it easier and sacrifice some things for him as well. And in this situation right here, it's so sad that I don't know how y'all panel works, that y'all come together, that y'all not even looking at the big picture over it all. We got kids dying every single day. We got them killing themselves over bullying. We got people out here hungry. We have a man that's willing to go a million miles to make sure that these kids eat. He go out every year to feed families out of his own pocket. When you do not have, Coach Roski make sure it happens. When your kid is wrong or right, Coach Roski is there. He will bat for you like the end. Like just like he living in your household, he don't care about what situation it is. He puts so much potential, and he pushed these kids to be men because he knows, and I know he knows, they have so much potential, and he want nothing but excellence from these young men. And I thank God for the coaches. I thank God for everybody that's here, cause I know God got a bigger plan for Coach Roski, and everything's gonna be all right. Thank you. Um, next, we have Annie Bruce. Good evening. Um, I'd like to first and foremost thank 
Cleveland Heights teachers and coaches and Coach Rotsky <coughs> for providing us with a community that is worth fighting for. Um, my son has been in this community and played with these boys since fifth grade. We have watched these boys grow up. We have watched these, these young men become men. Um, and I think we have to talk about family. We are a community, and in our community, we have become a family. And I have to thank Coach Rotsky and the coaches for that because I wouldn't have met um, some of the wonderful people that I know and parents that I know and kids that I know and that we know if it wasn't for Coach Rotsky and his coaching staff and the long trips and the cold weather and the <laughs> rain and snow and, and being together as a family. But more importantly, I think we forget about just how much time and dedication this man gives to our children. Um, countless hours, every day, every day, every moment of every day. And the bottom line is families, families are kind of messy. <laughs> I mean, we all have families. We all love our families. I don't know a perfect family. Families, you know, we love our families because of their imperfections and because we come together as a family tree. And you think about trees, what makes trees unique are their knots and their branches, and they reach out and they envelop us all. And that's what that man has done for us and for our children. And I can't thank him enough, and I can't thank coaches enough, and I can't thank parents that are here enough for our children, for our children's futures, because I care about this community. Everyone in this building cares about this community, and I want everybody to just look around at all of us that are here, and I want us to remember this because this is what needs to happen more often. We need to come together and support the people who really make a difference in our children's lives. Thank you very much. Okay, um, next we have DC. Yes, my name is Derek. Um, I moved here in about four or five years ago. I moved here because of Roski. I was a youth coach for three years with the program. And I've seen hundreds of boys on a field, young men, second, third grade. I participated with the middle school. I gave a pizza party this summer provided pizza, other parents provided soda for the kids. I've seen a lot of these kids touch. I'm in the street, on my neighborhood. These kids have pride in this program. I'm from Detroit. I've seen changes of coaches, teachers, where it was detrimental. And you make a change, it affect the program and affect the neighborhoods, OK? So this is where I'm going to start. I'm going to ask a question. Public records. Who do I go in contact for public records? Yes. Now, I'd like to contact you for anything that has to deal with Roski's evaluation, objectives, and find out exactly was he being held accountable for this program, OK? Because I'm hearing rumors that he's being held accountable for things that's outside of his control. Beyond, beyond Saturday, okay? So I'm gonna contact you, I'll see you after, okay? An <laughs> another question I have, I heard a rumor that small school principals and administrations are gonna be abolished. Is that true? I'm asking you now. Is that a rumor? Finish your statement and we'll- when Okay, we'll, that'd be a question and, on the yeah, table. Yeah. Okay, fine. Now, I have a lot of respect for every body, every nationality in this community. I also heard a rumor that it was put on the table that the high school would play on Jewish holidays. In the past, we haven't. And that's a respect, because one of the persons that touched my life was a guy named Shuak. And he touched me to get out of Detroit. And if you know Detroit, it's hard to get out of that city. OK? Is that true? That's a question. Next, we're moving in the right direction. And on TV, people are sitting at home eventually will see this. 
I wanted to be very clear that what we say here as a family will go and be seen by multiple families. You have a program that is strong now. I asked a question at one meeting a couple of weeks ago, how was the program before? It sounds like it wasn't respected. It didn't have a lot of students graduate. Do you realize how many hundreds and hundreds of men that you have developed over the years? How many hundreds and hundreds of students today from second? Do you realize that his program extends to the youth program? I hope you understand that. It's not just the four, high, the four years of high school students. It's not just the middle school. It extends all the way down to where it is to the second grade, to the third grade. You remove him, you remove a lot because what happens to that focus of these kids? Now that focus to play ball, he requires them in class to be good students and good participants in the community. They have a sense of ownership of this community. Remove that and see what happens. I can tell you in multiple cities, when that happens, you have other issues. If someone loves the people like he loves, these children, these families, and you remove that and you just get someone here that just cares about wins and losses? What happened to those kids in the street? Now, I want to make sure you're clear. This is being recorded, right? And I want to make sure I'm clear that when I go door to door in the community, <coughs> bar to bar, barbershop to barbershop, and let them know what's going on with this community, about this man, how he loves it, and how we have disrespected his only wish to be his son, be with his son. I want you to make sure that we're all clear that we are here together to let you know on notice that I will spread that word. Thank you. Jahara Price. Price. Um, good evening, everyone. And I appreciate everyone taking the time out to come out. And I also want to um, talk about things from a different perspective. We've moved to Cleveland Heights about 14 years ago, and um, the city has been great for us. We enjoyed Noble Elementary. We enjoyed Monticello. And we are enjoying Heights High. My daughter is in her third year in Kent State, so the school system works. But also what I want to um, talk about is some of the things that the community put into place for every community member. Years ago, it was a, a campaign about civility. And we all had t-shirts. And we all had it in our windows. And we wanted our community to be better and tolerate every single person in our community. And I think that tonight, I'm concerned about that tolerance level. I don't know if we're concentrating on what civility really means, and we're taking it to heart, and we're still teaching our kids about it. And I'm concerned about that. But what I'm more concerned about is what I've spent the last 25 years doing as a career. I'm in corrections, and I work down at the sheriff's office for Cuyahoga County. And when I first started there, our juvenile population was so small, we just had to find a little small area to occupy those juveniles and get them to court and to prison. Now, our juvenile population is overwhelming. Our 18 to 21 population is more overwhelming. And it's concerning for me, not just as a parent that has a 17-year-old son, but as a community member, and just as looking at the whole big picture, we have to do things that are going to reinforce what we want our community to look like later. And it may seem that this is small, to take away a coach that's going to provide. Do you know I receive more text messages from Coach Roski <laughs> than I do from both of my kids together? In the middle of the night when I'm laying down to go to sleep and my phone rings and I'm like, who is this sending me a text message? It's Coach Roski. And guess what? Not only do I receive that message, but the children receive that message and collectively, because we know one thing for sure, I participated in a program that was families and schools together. And we can't forget that. It's about the families and the schools working together for what we hope to be the same same, same goal at the end, for our kids to be successful and to sit where Nancy Pepler is sitting and Ronald Register is sitting and to take over my 
career and be capable after a good college degree. And one thing I know for sure, sports and academics together, that gets you to success, that gets you through college, that gets you to the next level. So my only concern is this. I've seen my son tear up many times in Monticello. I know his friends are going to say, Lee, you tear up? Yes, he does. <laughs> and it's been a while. And it's from the development of that football team. We have seen some of these kids. We played youth football with the high schools, the basketball, baseball, and we've been here with these kids. And I don't want to see it close this way. This is not the ending that we want. We want to see him continue to do good, and everybody needs to make modifications. If it's more profanity than necessary, okay, he already convinced me he'll tone it down in one of those midnight text messages. <laughs> Saturday games, okay, Fridays our kids are up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and you mean to tell me that we want them to play and win a game all the way till 10 o'clock at night? We can make compromises, <laughs> but we have to focus on our end result, and everyone sitting here, I would think our end result is our children. So I want to challenge everybody to be a little bit more tolerant, to practice what that civility campaign meant to everybody, and let's make the best choices for our children today, next year, and the year after, or whenever. Let's make those choices. Thank you. Um, we have one more, um, Karen Jones. You could. I'll 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 recognize you after Karen speaks. Okay. I'm supposed to say my name. Oh, you said it. Okay. That's okay. I said your name. Um, I came here this evening. Actually, I was at home, and my children sent me a text, and to just let me know what was going on here tonight. Um, as most people that might be in this room know, I'm not a big <coughs> fan of Coach Roski. We have had our differences. But there's one thing I can't deny, and when I was sitting at home debating if I was coming here tonight or not, was that he did make a difference in the lives of my children. And that's more important than my, how I feel about him or what kind of man I think he is or is not. My personal opinion of him doesn't matter based on what he did for my children. Um, he doesn't do everything right. And none of us do. And if we did, we wouldn't be here. We'd be in heaven um, because that's where the perfect person is. So <coughs> even in the trials of, of football, I have th this is my second football coach. Um, unfortunately, with my first son, because the program was not where it needed to be, and I'm a Heights alumni, and it broke my heart, I had to send my son, my oldest son, somewhere else to get that football that he needed in order to go to college. And we didn't want him going with out of a program that didn't give him that fight and that drive and that desire to be the best. My last two sons played under Coach Roski, and they were able to develop that and to see that and to grow, but not just on the football field, but also in the classroom. They had me as a mother, so grades weren't going to be an issue. But to have somebody else that was constantly on them to make sure that they were doing the right thing and to have my 23 year old and 20 year old son still text to their friends gf gf they were pre he preached the same things that we preached in our house god family grades and football and to this day at their age they are still gf gfing in a good way um so i think the impact that he has made overall to this program. I see people in the audience now that I talked to that were looking to go other places, that were looking to send their children to go to other schools. But because of our football pro program, because of Coach Roski, he was preaching the same thing I was preaching to them. And they fed into that and believed in that. And they've come here. They believe in the academics of Heights High. They believe in the football program at Heights High. And I just think to remove that and take that away based on desires of others and what some people want to see is not the best way to do it, especially on the first go round. I think that if 
we're looking to do something like that, then you give it years. You give it a chance to develop the relationships to develop between though all those parties involved and not just go off of one year and say that's it because coach Roski has to grow on you and that's that's an honest fact and I'm sure a lot of parents out here will attest to that he has to grow on you and in one year it's not going to happen but I guarantee you the opportunity to see what he does to see that the legend does start on Lee Road because when he put those shirts up that first year, everybody's like, the legend. Okay, what is all this about? And then with my last, my last son's um, final year here, and we saw the legend, not the legend, the legend of Coach Roski that was able to bring all of these boys together and to bring this community. That levy passed because of that football team that year. And because we were able to bring the community together and they got behind that football team and that was because of Coach Roski and all the things that he had done. So like I said, I believe in giving people a chance to do what they do. And yes, you need parameters. I coach and I holler and I have some of my former coaching kids out here and they'll tell you I'm probably like a little junior Coach Roski. But they still call me to this day. They still text me. They still want to be my friend on Facebook. Because when you show children that you love them and that you care about them, and maybe you don't do it always the right way. We don't even do it the right way with our kids. But when they know that you care and that you're going to go the last mile of the way for them, they're going to go the last mile away for you also. So I'm just asking to let him grow on whoever he needs to grow on, give him that opportunity to keep impacting lives, to keep touching families, and to keep being the man that he is. He can get a little better, but to keep, let him do what he does. And that's why I had to come tonight. I was sitting at home with a pizza in the oven, but I took it out and I was like, I wouldn't be right if I didn't come because of the impact. And last thing I want to say, even in with my last son's mishap and bad judgment or lack of judgment, Coach Roski and the coaches at Cleveland Heights High School, when they found out, they called my son. And they gave him every encouragement and every uplifting thing that they could do and say and talk to other coaches at other schools to help give him another opportunity to be the man that we all know that he can be. So on film, I want to thank Coach Roski and the coaching staff for being there for the Joneses and let him continue to be here for Cleveland Heights High School. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Karen, Karen, while you're walking away, come on up. I want to tell you I loved your pictures of your mother working out at the hotel. She's doing better than me. I know. How old is she? She'll be 86 in two months. <coughs> that cracked me up. Thank you for that indulgence while you were walking up. What's your name? My name is Johnny Lemons. For those that don't know me, I'm the criminal justice teacher here at Cleveland Heights High School. Let me give you a little bit of background about myself. I grew up in Glenville, okay? As stated earlier, Cleveland Heights was the laughing stock of football, of everything when I grew up, okay? Because it was a soft environment. I apologize if I offend you, but I'm gonna tell you like it was. This was the softest environment around here. Okay, especially when it came down to sports, for those that know what went on around here. Okay, Not eight years ago when Roski came here, I was coaching in Euclid. I refused to coach here because of the demeanor. A lot of it was because you baby these kids. These kids are super babied. Their parents babied them, the board babied them, administration babied them. We had problems in school. The second year that I was here, I decided to come on board with Coach Roski. I started off with Ms. Jones' youngest son. And I said the only way that I would is if I could start off with the freshmen. Okay? Started off with the freshmen, and that was the first team that made the playoffs here in Cleveland Heights. Okay? Now, a little bit of my background. I graduated. I left St. Joe's because, I mean, I left. Glenville and didn't go there, but I went to St. Joe's, the most prestigious high school that was in the area at the time in the 80s. 
left there, went on to Ashland College on an academic scholarship, turned down an athletic scholarship. <coughs> After that, I got my bachelor's. Then I went on, got my master's in criminal justice. I'm a retired state trooper and a retired correction officer with the juvenile division. So I, I can say I, I know a lot about kids because I worked with the juveniles in the juvenile prisons for 10 years, okay, before going on the highway patrol. Coming here and starting to coach, we had kids at football practice that was getting carted off by the police when we, when Coach Roski first came. They were breaking the houses, they were getting trouble in the community, and they would go to jail. So what Coach Roski did is he made practices more strenuous. He made more time. Yeah, I know we get, I get tired too. I, it's a seven day a week job for me just to coach here, okay? During my class periods, I have kids, and half these kids in here, first of all, look at these kids in here. You have alumni that have come back. All the alumni raised your hand and came from college to be here. They came back just to be here to support Coach Roski, okay? You don't realize what has happened for the new people around here. Some of the older people, you realize the change that has happened around here. You are starting to try to put this school back in the school district back in the dark ages. It's not about winning football games. It's about winning lives. Yeah. Look at these kids. We giving these kids an opportunity that nobody else has given them. There's two coaches in Northeast Ohio that's going out of the way to get kids in college. Okay, one is Gann at Glenville, the other is Roski here at Cleveland Heights. Yeah. Those are the only two. St. Ignatius, St. Ed's, they have the state championships and all that, but on the average, they get two to three kids going off to school to play football. Academics is not going to be everybody's forte. We need options. Just like I teach the kids in criminal justice, you need options. Talking about criminal justice and options. There's only three high schools in the state of Ohio. High schools, not career centers, high schools. They have OPATA, which is Ohio Peace Officer Training Academy. We are one of those three. Under the tutelage of myself, Coach Roski, and the due diligence of these kids that's here, we are the number one program in the state of Ohio, <laughs> okay? It's a shame that when you get people here that want to do the right thing, you snatch that rug up under them. He's not the one that does all of the cussing and everything. It's me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I, I'm being honest. I'm a retired state trooper, and I yell at these kids. I yell at them. It's not a cussing at the kids, but sometimes that's what their motivation is. And it's not a, a cussing at them or anything malicious. It's the words might come, hey, get your ass over here or something like that, and that's what it is. If you want to be upset at anybody, because I'm the team disciplinarian, if you want to be upset at anybody, I'll take that. I'll show to that, because Roski tell us all the time, you make the coaches get down and get five or 10 push-ups when they cuss. When he do push he he cuss, he'll do push-ups. I'm the only one to say, no, I'm not doing it, and nobody's going to make me do it. <laughs> but I'm the one that does that when you hear it. So if you want to get rid of me, get rid of me. I won't coach. But he gives these kids an opportunity that nobody else has ever given them. You have something good going on here, and you're about to lose it. Because every year, you have at least 12 to 15 kids signing letters of intent. All right. Oh, wait, OK, I know I got one more minute. But I'm going I'm, to I'm challenge you as a board. We have ceremonies for athletics, letter of intent. How many ceremonies have you given for our academic people. Where's the letter of intent for full ride scholarships for 4.0 students? We don't have them. We don't celebrate our kids academically. And because we don't celebrate our kids academically like that, they have to turn to something. Because these kids need to have something to recognize their good. I I'm talking right now. Let me talk. You could talk later. Please. OK? It's they, ha they have to have something to celebrate. And if it's something as simple as this, let them celebrate it. And I'm going to end with just saying, that's not the man that you want to get rid of. If you do, you setting this district back. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Um
Um, I think we did, uh, I, I at least did agree to address the two questions that were asked specifically. Um, number one, and I'm glad that you asked those, and we're not going to get into a prolonged conversation here about this tonight. We have an agenda to move, to, to move forward on, but um, I'm glad you asked in the way that you did in terms of rumors that are out there. The, the small schools is, is unrelated whatsoever it, um, to anything related to Coach Rotsky or any decision from Principal Ross. Um, which I also understand is is the rumor that's out there. That's a decision based that has come out of um, the the plan going forward and moving to Wiley and moving forward. The district and the administration made the decision to do away th with the small schools, which means we don't need small schools principals going forward. So that's completely not related. Um, and in terms of the Jewish holidays, I'm not sure how to respond to that. I don't, uh, I, I know. I, Eric, Eric knows. Yeah. I, well, I checked, I heard that, I got that, that this morning. And too. I went to uh, a Chabad website. Uh, uh, as far as my understanding, because the Jewish holidays are always flopping around, um, for 2015, the high holidays, was which we always, <coughs> always plan around, um, not, my understanding for 2015, they're like, a, either, again, Friday or the beginning of the, more of a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, beginning of the week. So for 2015, I'm seeing no conflict because when I heard that, I was like, wait, we would never do that. Um, so for the high holidays of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur in 2015, my understanding, it would not be a conflict for a Friday or Saturday night um, because I believe they're falling at the beginning of the week as opposed to the end. Um, I, I'll double, I can double, we can double check again, but my understanding from checking on a, a, a site that I trust had it, had the high holidays falling at the beginning of the week and not the end of the week. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're moving forward with the agenda. We do appreciate your um, coming tonight and and expressing your strong opinions and and um, and emotional and heartfelt um, experiences. I do appreciate that, and and please feel free to be in touch with us and with the administration who. Um, handles these situations. I'm, I'm sorry, we don't take questions from the audience for board meetings. <laughs> yeah, well, no, but we don't, we don't take questions from the audience during board meetings. So, so. No. No, I'm not getting upset. I'm saying that we're not, we won't respond to questions from the audience. Okay. agenda um, next the superintendent's report okay All right. so we have the approval of the field trips we have that one mm -hmm. oh we start with family connections so I would like to for Joanne trip. Fetterman to yeah, come we'll up we'll do, no, we we'll do, do the, the, field trip. the field trips first okay okay can I have a motion to approve the Heights High <coughs> football I mean <coughs> baseball it's baseball trip to Cocoa Beach, Florida, scheduled for April 4th to 11th. So moved. Second. Does anybody have any questions? No questions. I just have one question, and I don't know who can, I don't know if anyone here can answer the, I have a question about the, um, the, the roster does not include the softball families, softball attendees, and it said it was for baseball and softball. So if we could get an answer on that down the line, that's fine. Okay. Okay, Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Silverman. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Mr. Coble. Yes. Ms. Pepler. Yes. Mr. Register. Yes. <coughs> Nancy. 
Maybe we ought to take a break and let them get out of here. Well, I don't... Go to, go to item B. Do the, do the boilerplate stuff for people. Do item E. It's all personnel. Okay, Joanne. We're gonna we're gonna move on to just some straight businessy things while people are filing out. Okay, is that okay? Absolutely, forgive me. Okay, we're gonna move to item E personnel. Um, can I have a motion to approve items E one through four? So moved. Second. Okay. I just have a here. I'm sorry. You guys Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Mr. Koval? Yes. Ms. Pepler? Yes. Mr. Register? Yes. Mr. Silverman? Yes. Oh. Okay. So, um, we went through personnel. Let's go back to the, sup the rest of the superintendent's report at this point. Okay. So, I would like to have um, Joanne Fetterman, the Executive Director of Family Connections. She's going to do a presentation to update the board on the Thank progress you. of the program. Thank you very Welcome. much for having me tonight. Appreciate it. I think I'm going to take my, um, put my attention to you as well as to everyone in the audience for being here tonight. Um, we're about families, which <laughs> given what we listen to is very uh, emotional probably for all of us. But um, anyway, thank you very much for um, allowing um, me to come tonight and talk about family connections. Um, I want to thank the district, the Board of Education, um, school board members, administration, teachers, parents, children, so many of you have made it possible for, um, for our children to be ready for kindergarten. Um, before I forget, because I may if I get nervous, I want to acknowledge Sharnice Holmes. Um, Sharnice, would you, would you stand, please? <laughs> Sharnice um, is the coordinator of the Family School Connection Program, which you'll find out a little bit more about as we go on with the PowerPoint. So let me begin. Uh, Family Connections, there's our website if you want to know um, more about us. Um, mission, vision, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, strengthening families could mean a lot of things. We believe that it's, it starts with an individual family connecting to other families, children connecting to children, parents connecting to parents, um, family to family, and that's really what builds community. So um, it's pretty straightforward with the vision. <clears throat> we worked really hard on thinking through what our core values are. Um, it, it was, um, and actually the most important one is at the very, very bottom which you can't see, but in addition to envision, connect, collaborate, respond, the last one is play. That's how we survive this life. That's how we become resilient. Play sometimes gets a bad rap. Play is how we learn. Play is what makes us human. Play is what gives us resiliency. It's what helps us adapt. So don't ever let anybody tell you play is nothing because play is really the core of everything and it's our last core value. We highly value our partnership with the Cleveland Heights University High School District. It deserves its own slide. We have partnered together with the school district for over 30 years. Our Actually, our, our whole, our inception started because two Cleveland Heights University Heights educators, Carolyn Grossman and Barbara Sewells, realized how important it, it was and still is in giving parents opportunities to learn how to raise their children. How can we help parents assume their role as their child's most important teacher? And then we share this legacy of family engagement, which I know Dr. Dixon um, continues that tradition of the family engagement group that meets that I believe Sharnice Holmes is, is, a, is a part of. And we are working with the district together to ensure school readiness for all students. 
We start that at birth, by the way. You don't wait till right before a child is ready for kindergarten. You start right away at birth. And that's why early literacy is one of our core focus points. That doesn't mean illiterate, by the way. Early literacy means how you learn language, how you develop your skills to be ready for kindergarten. We do this by having family literacy playrooms. Um, there is one housed in the Heights Library. Please go visit. It's a really cool place. It's called Little Heights. It's about bringing meaningful, meaningful play to children. You walk in and the room looks like um, a miniature neighborhood. There's a post office, there's a little restaurant, there's a grocery store. That's how children learn. That's how we learn in everyday activities. It's not rocket science. It's just going to a grocery store and learning that you can teach your child about all sorts of things, colors, shapes, counting, sorting, by being in a grocery store. So those are the things that we're encouraging parents and children. Grandparents are there also, by the way. Um, guardians are there. We have wonderful staff who guide the play, who make the room what it is, who bring all the important materials together. The program is free, and there are no eligibility requirements. You don't lose eligibility, and you can't go there anymore. You can stay there and attend as much as you want, as often as you want. In the program, we've seen 870 families visit our playrooms for a total of 5,582 5, visits. Um, the playrooms are not seen as a substitute for preschool programs. They're meant to complement. They can really be a wonderful way to complement what children are already gaining in a preschool program. In many ways, we have families who aren't, whose children are not enrolled yet in preschool programs. Sometimes we can encourage families to do a last year of preschool before entering kindergarten. Sometimes it's just that family's preference not to be in a preschool. And so this program can sometimes be a substitute. It also can complement. It's also one of the things that I wanted to tell you about that you should be very proud about for Cleveland Heights, University Heights, is that um, the Cleveland Central Promise neighborhood um, is seriously looking at replicating the model of Little Heights in Central. That's how much they think that this program really can make a difference in preparing children for school. So stay tuned. You may see something in conjunction with the Cleveland Public Library soon. This is a, a great quote that I'll just leave up there for a minute, but uh, we pulled it from one of the parents um, and, and how she understood our programming to not only be important for children, not only being important for parents, but what it really does for the whole community. Um, it really helps build community by parents making friends and wanting to stay within the community. Parenting support is another key point besides early literacy. Parenting support is something we highly value. We hold parenting classes twice a year, which are free. We provide child care, and we provide a light supper. Um, we first focus on how, in order to be a better parent, you have to really, we have to take care of you first. We have to be aware of the stresses that you're going through as a parent. You can't focus very much on your child until you're able to understand what you're going through yourself as a parent, and we understand that. I think we've all experienced that personally as parents. Um, having an opportunity to talk to a group of people, to learn from one another, as well as to learn from um, our facilitator, who is in the back there, Valerie Dowery, um, does our parenting classes for us. Those are held at the Coventry Building, by the way. Not only do we have family literacy playrooms, we have family playrooms. This one is at the Coventry Building. And you can see our staff person standing up over there. I don't know if everybody can. Um, Ellen Barrett is, is, the, is the key professional staff who is, is there to guide, to listen, um, to be kind of a matchmaker, to introduce parents to parents, to be a 
sometimes to uh, intervene when a problem is about to happen between two children. She senses it right away. She steps in and she shows another way of handling um, a conflict. It's great socialization for parents and for children. Our staff provide relevant information about parenting and child development. And w the one bullet point that we put on there that um, I want to point out about family connections is increasing civic engagement. What that means is that many of the families who have come to, the, to us when their children are babies are now in leadership roles in the community. And we're going to take some credit for that because what we think happens and what we know happens is that we're building confidence when you are a parent, when you have a child for the first time and you have no clue what you're doing and you gain confidence that confidence begins to take hold of your how you feel about yourself and how you work in the community. So we, we know for a fact that we have parents who have gone on to be board members of Family Connections, um, been active with PTO, so we're going to take credit for that. Parenting support, we gave you a, a quote from a, a study in 2004. You're welcome to read that. Um, there's more and more information out there that understands that children don't come with instructions. Um, and sometimes some children give us a little more challenge than others. Um, and that there is, it's important to get support and help with that. That really makes a difference. That's what's needed to strengthen families. And we do all of those things at Family Connections. School readiness. Um, Again, I said it, did, it does start at birth, but if we haven't touched you, if we haven't worked with you when your child was born, because maybe you weren't living here at the time, or you didn't know about us, we catch up to you a little bit later. Um, and we do a program called SPARK, Supporting par Parents to Assure Ready Kids. That's for children ages three and four and their parents. We have funding to provide that service in the Cleveland Heights University Heights School District. We have parent partners who work in the home on a monthly basis providing, it's, it's like a home tutoring, but the difference is that the parent partner includes the parent and the child together with lessons that are geared toward getting children ready for school getting parents ready for school. Their motto is ready kids, ready parents, ready schools. Um, one of the things that we like to point out in terms of trends is that the Spark children score statistically significantly higher on the assessments, on the entrance um, assessments for kindergarten. Now it's called the CRA. They drop the L. Um, but we have, we know that for sure. Uh, we have the year we started in 2010 with the cohort year number one, that group is now in third grade, and we're going to really see a big difference at that point. We have longitudinal studies from Canton, Ohio, that have, whose child, who those cohorts have already gone through that, and it really does make a significance. So we're there for you when your children are born. We're there for you when your children are three and four. And then we come to a program called Family School Connection, which is near and dear to our hearts. We began this program as a pilot at Oxford Elementary in 2005. We expanded to all seven elementary schools in 2007 with a generous grant from United Way. We couldn't do the program, however, without support from the district uh, in many ways. Um, this is a multiple funded program. Of which you can imagine serving all seven schools. Um, it is designed to meet needs, and when we say at-risk children, we're talking about children who are at risk for not reading at grade level. That's one of the, that, that's probably the point at which um, we will see your children. It's comprised of the following components, the ABCs of kindergarten, kindergarten kickoff, classroom visits, uh, play a day, and home visits. Um, we put all those things together because we think that's what it takes to really be able to make a difference in, um, in making a moving, what did they say, moving along the, I forgot what that expression is. Anyway, it's not the pipeline, it's moving, moving the, 
Thank you. It's moving the needle along. I knew there was some expression <laughs> like that. Um, the um, ABCs of kindergarten is in July, um, before kindergarten begins. We hold it at the Little Heights program at the Cleveland Heights Library. That's where we're encouraging families to become accustomed to the library, as well as learn some very significant um, skills that are going to be needed. A lot of people still, from when we all went to kindergarten, we all know that it's a lot different now. Um, what we're doing in kindergarten now is probably what maybe we did in second grade when we were all in kindergarten. So we're also helping parents understand what's going to be expected of children when they are in kindergarten. Kindergarten kickoff is a one session uh, program in all of the elementary schools in August. So everybody gets a chance to meet the principal, the teachers, and our staff give the parents an opportunity to talk about their anxieties about their child starting kindergarten. And then we get a chance, then the children separate and go on into the classrooms and meet the kindergarten teacher as well. Uh, classroom visits are a very important part of this program. Our school liaisons are in the classrooms on a regular basis because their liaison role is to bridge the gap between the school and the home. So they're learning what the child needs. When they make the home visit, they can carry over some of that information into the home. The Play-A-Day program happens. It's a five-week evening series that happens in all of the schools in the fall. It is um, dinner um, and playtime, which is, I should, again, don't want to downplay the word play, it is very significantly looking at how do you enjoy learning? How do you put a bingo game in front, which is fun, but it's also really teaching you alphabet recognition. It's teaching you the things that are already expected in kindergarten. Um, we have the whole family come, actually, so that you don't have to worry about leaving somebody behind at home. We have the whole family come on the nights of the play day. Home visits are the the, the final component of this, home visits really give our liaisons an opportunity to do one-on-one -on -one, uh, programming, bringing what's in the home and helping, I'm bringing what's happening in the classroom into the home and providing activities and um, opportunities, again, with the parent, showing the parent what the parent can do to reinforce everything that is being learned in kindergarten. One of the things that I want to before I forget, um, we did some open-ended questions at the last at the play days, which ended in November, I believe. Um, this is what some of the families said. This program has enlightened me about how to help me help him. I really enjoyed the program. I see a difference in my children reading and writing. We have enjoyed the program and have learned new and exciting ideas of learning. This program has been very helpful and encouraging. I have developed an understanding of my son's needs and confidence in my ability to help him. In addition to what, uh, to the parents' comments that I just read, the other things that we know about the program since we have started this, that's 2005, so that's a, quite a long time ago, is that we are building children's literacy levels and school readiness skills. Probably the mo one of the most important things to us is that second bullet point of increasing parental engagement in their child's education. Um, it's, it's just critical. Uh, all the research as well as just our instincts are that it makes a difference when everybody's involved in helping children. It's not just the school's responsibility. It's not just the parents' responsibility. It's not just family school connection. It's everybody together making a difference for children. We're helping parents promote a literacy-rich atmosphere in the home. With the home visits, we're giving suggestions of what parents can do. Um, parents are learning the academic and behavioral expectations of students. That's pretty overwhelming. Um, and our liaisons really, really <coughs> spell it out very, very I guess repeatedly and, and um, in, a, in a manner that everybody can understand. Um, making that bridge between home and school, facilitating the communication between parents and school personnel. We think it's a great program and we really appreciate the support that the district has given for us to continue that program. Our future, 
almost end with this. This will be the second last slide. Um, sustainability is big for everybody. Um, we, uh, we have United Way funding to continue uh, many of our programs, um, but what it really takes is, is funding from multiple sources so that we're not solely depending on one. Um, we do have foundation support. We have Title I funding. Um, we have multiple grants that we are busy working on, but um, again, we would like to sustain this program with you. Uh, we'd love to expand it. We'd love to expand all of our services. I, I think we're barely touching the surface of what we can do. And we'd like to see our partnerships flourish for the next 10 to 20 years and more with the schools, with the libraries, and with the communities as well. Last slide. Once again, thank you so much for everything. And if there's <coughs> any questions. Um, Please, please. Yeah. So when we started the program, I Can you come up to the mic and sure. please let's not have questions from the audience. Okay. okay. I, I, and you can grab people after the presentation if you want to ask additional questions. So the majority of our program of the kids that we serve are currently third graders and the majority of those students with a third grade guarantee our kids who have passed the third grade guarantee and will not be retained. We now have a program that's the last two years where we're working with incoming kindergartners because we want to make sure that our kids are, are ready for kindergarten. And I wish there was a parent here who came to one of our classes. It's called the ABCs of Kindergarten. And we started that last year. And her daughter, and we work with the registrars in Cleveland Heights and in Shaker Heights. And they brought their child, and what we do is the parents sit with their kids for 10 minutes, and they do an inventory to see what skills their kids possess and that they need for kindergarten. So to answer your question, I wish the parent was here, because when her kid started, her kid was not ready for kindergarten. She just came to me on the way out and said, my daughter just read a story to her class. And so to answer your question, call me in about nine years, and I can tell you, if, if we have funding, <laughs> the great work that we do, but part of what I wish is that some of the families that left who had kids in kindergarten, that they would have stayed because their kids could have benefited from this program. And so we're going to come out and talk to the football team. Thank you. Um, but I would like to thank you. Um, thank you for your program. I've had the opportunity to actually attend a play date. Oh, you um, went to one of the play Yes, days. it was actually um, a learning opportunity for me to see how that program helped parents mm -hmm. teach their students. Um, so, and, and the parents were so just as enthused as the students were. Um, and so you see the parents helping the kids, the kids helping the parents. Yeah. So it was a wonderful experience for me to be involved in. And as I stated to you uh, on our early meeting, what can a district do to strengthen that program? Because we know that early learning is important. Right, right. Um, the state has, uh, the, the, the superintendent of the state has pushed funding for it. It push funding for it nationally, and we want to make sure that all our students are ready, are ready for preschool, ready for kindergarten. Okay. Um, so it's definitely a, a program that we're going to continue to support. And that was a very good question that was raised. We want to see some long-term results um, from our students that they're passing, they're, they're coming to school ready, they're passing right, that kindergarten right. readiness test, but they're reading every night with their parents and with other adults. So thank you for your program, and thank you for your commitment to the district. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next we have our MSAN presentation. So these are our students. We're excited about our high school students. Um, as you know, um, Cleveland Heights um, is one of our founding districts for our uh, MSAN, and our students have the opportunity to go to Michigan to spend some time with other students um, <laughs> other MSAN district students to really get some feedback and really learn some strategies on student voice. So their charge was to come up with some ways that the superintendent and the board could kind of look at different ways that we can improve their experiences at the high school and be able to talk about some things that we could help them do better. So I'm excited about the, the opportunity to, to, to hear their proposal. 
and for them to share their experiences that they had at the at the conference. So we have Mr. David P, who is our student advisor, and we have several students. And I, um, once they get set up there, come to the mic and introduce themselves to us. And students, if you can tell us uh, your name and your grade, please. And we can start with. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm Sydney Cook, and I'm a junior. Sydney. I'm Amanda Murray, and I'm a junior. My name is Taylor Jones, and I'm a junior as well. My name is Ebony Gray, and I'm a senior. My name is Kyla Mathis, and I'm a junior. My name is Isaac Pittman, and I'm a junior. <laughs> My name is Bryson Hunt, and I'm also a junior. My name is Darius Jones, and I'm a junior. Okay, we have one more teacher, Ms. Washington. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to admit you. Sorry, you thought we were one of the students standing there. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Sean Washington. I'm also a co-advisor for the MSAM group. And just so that you know, this is only a small portion of the students who went to the conference, but we'll tell you where the other students are in our presentation. Thank you. Okay. So, again, I'm, I'm David Peake. Thank you for your warm welcome. And uh, as things are having some technical difficulties, I just thought it Maybe. Okay. Could you help us, please? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so as we're as we're setting that up, as we're setting that up, I'll just go ahead and, and talk so we can we can skip actually through a couple of slides. I know the hour is getting late, uh, but there are a few things that we want to to present to you all tonight. Obviously, we want to talk about. Uh, the, the experience that the students had at the MSAN conference. We'd also like to talk about. Excuse me. He's, he's got. It. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> We'd also like to talk uh, about some of our pre-existing and current initiatives that we're looking to sustain this school year, um, as well as some of our new initiatives that that we began really uh, prior to the conference, and then we'll conclude with. Uh, some of the ideas that we that we brought back from Michigan. So um, I actually want to just jump right in there, and we will as soon as we are ready to yeah, just go. Yeah, jump in. Just a in. minute. Do you, do you have the hard we have copy? Our, you have um, copy? Yes. Okay. Do you want to just maybe Because we have our Yes, we have our hard copy. Let's start, let's start here. No. Okay. Um... Well, our first two MSAN field trips this year were to go see um, Kim Whitley and Nikki Giovanni speak. And these two are very inspirational women, and I really enjoy going to see them speak. What I got from both of them was, like, no matter where you start, you can always push forward and just stay strong and get where you want to be. Um, and no matter what hardships come your way, just keep going. Uh, Nikki Giovanni went through, like, a lot of, deaths a, a lot of deaths happened in her family and she kept writing poetry and she kept doing what she loves and kim whitley started off with little to nothing and now she has a show um yeah <laughs> multiple shows yeah. so i was very inspired by the two trips and yeah and um this year every year we go to the mlk um, black history month celebration at kent state university and this year yeah, there will be two speakers, and okay, <laughs> Julian Bond, who was one of the founders of SNCC during the Civil Rights Movement, and Michael Dyson, who is a public intellectual and a professor. So that'll be fun. Okay, <laughs> Thirsty Thursdays is. It's a wonderful program. It's where male speakers come and talk about their lives and how they became successful. And it encourages African American males to want to become successful young men. And this is how I got into MSAM. Oh yeah, and it inspired me to get into honors and AP courses, and I'm in two honors AP courses right now. No, that's it. That's 
So something that we implemented, um, I think something that we implemented, I think probably last year, right? A couple years back. A couple years back. Um, we implemented math tutoring. And a big reason why, as you can see, was our most failed class in high school, or our high school anyways, was geometry. Second most failed class was algebra one. Now this is a very big issue since, you know, we all have like within this country a big priority on math and science and reading and all those. So this was very shock shocking and alarming. And we wanted to do something to establish a basis of help for those that needed it. Even those that don't really need it, it's still, it's still there for them. So as, as you can see, there were 251 students that failed Algebra 1 in Geometry and Algebra 2. All these basic math courses that you take um, throughout your freshman and junior year of high school. And as you can see, you have these students, these peers, that help these other students. I know this kind of sounds redundant, but um, <laughs> you have these students that help their fellow peers. And it's really, it's very, it's very heartwarming. I won't say heartwarming. It sounds like all cheesy or cliche or whatever. But um, it's very, it's very nice to know that someone within your school actually cares about you and wants you to succeed and do well. And I used, I used to. I don't really have the time for it now. But I used to do it last year, and I always used to have like sophomores and freshmen come in, like, "Oh, I'm struggling. I don't know, really know what to do." And like, I always try to help them to the best of my ability, and they always like thank me, and like, I really never had that type of recognition before. It was, it was really nice to have that. So I'm glad that we implemented this. Okay, good. Just to piggyback on what he said, uh, actually because we're in the MSAN district, if you talk to me for any length of time, I'll talk about MSAN and I'll preach that we're in the MSAN district. So this year we, we've also enlisted the help of the National Iron Society students because they are part of MSAN. If you're in this room and you're a part of our community, you are part of MSAN. So it's not just our MSAN students, but National Iron Society students and really just students that we just saw and said, you know what, you're pretty sharp in math. Why don't you come and be a tutor? So we want everyone to be involved. So those are, are three of the, the uh, initiatives that, that we've sustained. We'll now move to some of the things that we began to implement prior to our trip to Michigan. So we had a um, honors and AP ice cream social. And we had some teachers that taught honors and AP classes come. And we had over 100 students. We ran out of toppings and bowls. <laughs> um, so there was a survey on every table for the students to fill out. And the, here's some of the data that we gathered from. Oh. Um, one of the, like, I guess the best data we found um, was that we gave out, which Mr. Peek is handing out now, um, strategies that could help in honors and AP classes. And 32 of the students of 45 who took their survey said that <coughs> it would <coughs> help them. <coughs> and that's right, from social. And so. M sign quarterly. This is a newspaper publication, kind of, that we started um, probably a couple months ago this year. Um, and really, what it highlights is, as I said before, you know, like with football and everything, how we really don't seem to highlight the academic part of high school. This is what this is for now. So we're really here to highlight those, as you can see, minority AP student of the month and they get their own section, they get their own highlight. They get to be sort of a hero within the school and be seen as <coughs> someone to be like aspired and someone to be like, I don't wanna say like, well, kind of a mentor, someone that you can look up to and like strive to be. And also, it also um, has current events and things like that that are going on within the United States or in within our community. And as you can see, this is our, I think our first issue, That's yeah. This is our first issue, and you can see the student highlights on the left. You can see three of our very own um, MSAN students that are highlighted there. And they all are a part of the early college program at Heights. And they all do very well, actually. 
So, <laughs> so yeah. So now we'll transition to uh, actually what we brought back from the conference. Um, as you know, we did um, attend the MSAN conference in Michigan uh, this past fall. And um, while we were at the conference, we visited the University of Michigan. Um, but mainly, we spent a lot of time with the other MSAN students from around the nation. Um, at this conference, the main thing that was emphasized was dialogue and being able to talk to other students from around the nation um, that were in, in MSAN and that have the struggles that we have and students that face the same issues that we do. Um, we, at this conference, we, um, we really utilized our resources and the things that were provided to us and we took a lot back from being able to talk to other students and and other students um, that were different than us. We were also exposed to a lot of diversity um, as well as other ideas that, um, which is what brought us to our idea of AP workshops. Okay. Um, the goal of our AP workshops was to um, increase um, minority enrollment and retention in AP courses because a lot of uh, students are often scared to get into AP and honors courses because of because a lot of students talk about the course load and that it's hard and a lot of students don't have the knowledge or the and they're not prepared to be in um, honors and AP courses so our intention was to or is to uh, prepare students for that and give them what we've taken from AP and honors courses and to help them do not only get into honors and AP courses but to do well Um, okay. Another um, idea that we brought back from the conference was a mentoring program, like a big brothers, big sisters sort of deal, because we noticed that um, high school is a time that is a very big transition, especially for incoming students. There are a lot of um, new standards and new expectations and a lot of obstacles that you aren't really comfortable maneuvering if you don't have experiences with those sort of challenges. So um, we thought it would be beneficial to pair um, underclassmen, specifically freshmen, with senior students to um, help them um, like circumvent like personal and academic challenges because they've been through high school before. They understand the issues that these students are facing and they'll be able to guide them and advise them. So they stay on track and like stay focused, keep their eye on the prize. So basically, um, there are two freshmen assigned to um, 24 seniors or two freshmen per 24 seniors, I apologize. Um, and so the seniors were selected by MSAN advisors and their teachers, and the freshman mentees were picked by their small schools. Each small school was given the opportunity to nominate 10 students, five males and five females that they thought would benefit from this sort of program. And we had our first like icebreaker activity between the mentors and the, mente the mentees this past month. It just kind of gave them the opportunity to mingle, get to know each other, to kind of formulate that bond that would lead to a productive like um, <coughs> mentorship relationship. And we'll continue to have activities such as those. We have one coming up this Friday um, to track that progress and to make sure that the students are comfortable with one another and that it's going to be a successful situation. So um, in this particular event, MSAN linked with the Holocaust class and we went to uh, go to Detroit and um, we went to the African American Museum as you can see and we also went to the Lessons of Holocaust Museum and it gave us an excellent, and I believe excellent, um, experience on our culture and history. Thank you very much. <laughs> So we have like several activities here in MSAN, but one of them was a Kwanzaa celebration. And we did the second one this year. <laughs> Sorry. And we did the second one this year and it was really fun. We had like alumni come back and it was really interesting because you know, Kwanzaa people think, well, I mean, it's like the African American, you know, <coughs> holiday. And even a lot of African Americans think it's not important, but it was nice because we saw like Muslim people come, Christians, they, it didn't even matter. So it was really fun. Um, and 
Yeah, we ate, so you could see. Yeah, we had a lot of... <laughs> and it was really nice because it shows, like, you know, the money that people give us isn't going to waste. Like, what you guys are doing is helping us, so, yeah. Got to plug some money, huh? Yeah. So, um, just, just to close, even as we speak now, uh, the, the topic, we have students that were split, some that wanted to be here tonight, uh, that actually went to Hudson High School for uh, this conversation about race, and that was really the big push for the conference that we just attended. Um, so as we speak, we do have students out at Hudson High School that are a part of that uh, courageous conversation. And if you could look here, these, this is what was sent to us, uh, conversations about if race actually exists. Uh, I won't read some of those, I just don't want to. Uh, but if you could look there, uh, if African Americans should receive reparations for slavery, um, if profiling is racist or simply effective police work, uh, these are things that uh, are, are really hot button issues and we want to, to train students to be able to talk about these things um, in a meaningful way, in a, in a productive way. So we are split tonight. Uh, but we're, we're proud of our students because they are doing the work of, of engaging all voices through dialogue. And just to close, if you want to stay connected with them, saying even as board members, you can join our Remind Me 101. Uh, you'll receive our text messages uh, to let you know that, that there is a meeting about to happen. Some of the, the text messages might not be, no, most of them won't be relevant to you because I'm sending out things myself, Ms. Washington and Mr. Williams. Uh, but if you just want to stay connected, uh, we try to be as transparent as possible because we believe that we're doing, that we're doing the right things. So um, just want to thank you all for giving myself, Ms. Washington and Mr. Williams, uh, the, the opportunity to advise these students. We really do enjoy them. Some of them I've had literally since the sixth grade. Uh, so I have a special relationship uh, when, I, when I think about them. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to come here and present. And if you have questions now, um, our students would answer those. Or no. I, I had one question on the, this slide. It's uh, topics or challenges, solutions. Open floor. What is that? I didn't. Oh, open floor. What's open floor? Oh, okay, so these are just things that, that students uh, suggested. And I think because at that event, we had actually, it was our largest event to date. Uh, since then, we've had Thirsty Thursdays that had over 200 students. So, but to this date, we had 120 maybe. Because we had so many, we could not have an open floor. Oh, okay. So they just, so many students wanted to talk. Um, and, if, and if you look at, at the graphs, there were students, most of the students said that if we did a follow-up, they would want to, they would want to attend. And we're thinking that that's where we would launch um, our AP workshop. So students would have an opportunity to sign up then and we could really get the ball rolling on that. I was just curious. Was, oh, they had small, they had new school back in the set. I wasn't sure if it was a program or if it was. Oh, a are session. you dating yourself? I, no, I, 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 I It was back in the day when I was there. So oh, was right, right, right. Like, so, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, it's not easy for me to talk tonight. Um, one of the students mentioned that when you got together, I think it was you, uh, when you got together, um, you talked to students from other areas about some of the problems and, and that were similar. Did you find that, that either you were able to help some of the students through problems that you had seen and come to solutions or come to ways to handle them or vice versa that they were able to help you or is it much more about talking about more widespread problems that you were going to work on together and try and come up with solutions? Um, I think that mostly the other students helped me um, mostly just to broaden my perspective because um, MSAN we are diverse but I've never seen any MSAN group that was as diverse as the students that were at that conference and um, I, my I, like all of our eyes were open to issues that students face that we don't necessarily recognize or take the time to recognize so I would say that um, we all identified with each other in a lot of ways but mainly just in opening each other's eyes and like giving each other like motivation Good. yeah that's good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's good. <coughs> okay. 
uh, as we leave, I just wanted to shout out someone at the back of the room, Mr. Womack. You look in this photo, he was one of our Thirsty Thursdays guests, just entered the district. You see him there toward the, toward the right, uh, really had an out, outstanding presentation. So I may call on a few of you at, at, at one point or another to, to come and be with us. So uh, just because he's here, I thought we'd give him some love. Yeah. But, well, I, I would like to say thank you to the students, but also to continue to challenge you to use your student voice. Um, I don't think that maybe we don't encourage that enough, but the experience is, just as you stated, that that experience is just being with other kids open your eyes about diversity. Because sometimes we think diversity looks a certain way until we get in other communities and see that diversity looks totally different from what we could imagine. <laughs> And there are other issues that are happening across the country. Um, so that's a good experience and good exposure for you to have. So continue to challenge what our perceptions are and, and read and get those experiences through your, your, your mentors because um, it's great. Um, and to those three students that I know we, that the picture from um, early college, I received an email from Mark Storr. I was sharing it with Nancy earlier that those students in early college did outstanding this semester. So make sure you tell them kudos. There was so, when he sent that email from, um, from John Carroll, you know, I, we smiled, um, and the board members should get it on Friday. But, um, but to see that those are MSAN students. So good work. We want to hear more about what you're doing and, and what you want us to do as a board to support your work and to support your experiences. Because we are a founding district. And because we are a founding district, we want to make sure to, that it's, it's, it's woven through the entire district, as someone stated. So um, kudos to you and your team. Okay. Yes. Yes. You all have an open invitation to come to any of our MSAM meetings. We have at least, at least, Mr. Peak, twice <laughs> a month. Twice so a month. come to our meetings. Thank you. Okay, so next we have Allison Bird who would come <laughs> up and kind of uh, and give us a stimulating presentation <laughs> of five to nine, Allison. Yes, yes. She'll be a quick yes. <laughs> Good evening. Hello. <laughs> Ladies and, and gentlemen, um, I just want to start by saying well, my name. My name is Allison Bird. I currently serve as the director of data research and assessment for the district, and I am going to be presenting this evening on um, the district's connection with MSAN, also referred to as the Minority Student Achievement. Uh, network and hopefully connecting that to the goals that the district set as part of the Ohio improvement process and then helping us look forward to um, the process that we're going to in, engage with strategic planning. But because I have the, 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 the floor and, and the mic, I want to make sure that I say that this is, I'm presenting, but this is not my work. That I, I am sharing the information of, of the work of many, many people in different roles, but I do want to make sure you had the opportunity to hear from some of our uh, MSAN students, Mrs. Washington and Mr. Peake, who serve as two of the three MSAN advisors at the high school level. There's also uh, Mr. Nate Marshall, who is the third advisor that serves at the high school. And then at each one of our middle schools, we also have um, teacher advisors. So it's Zakia Bergen, Deborah Oden, and Joshua Luton over at uh, Roxborough Middle School, Deborah Frost, um, Patrick Williams, and Jennifer Colvin at Monticello Middle School. And of course, we have the leadership team here at the board level, including ed services and student services, and then our, our building principals and other teachers who work to support that. So I don't get a chance to acknowledge those individuals very often, and it is important that I'm the, the messenger, certainly not responsible for everything that is here or that, that I'm going to share with you. So again, the information that I plan to share, I want to give you a, a, a brief history of MSAN and the district's involvement with it. So we're going to look at the organizational structure and um, some of the core practices that the district engages in, and then link that to the district goals and action steps. So it's a continuation of what we share, Dr. Selico and I shared in November, um, hopefully answering some of the questions that were raised there, and again, setting us up for the work that uh, the district will engage in as part of the strategic plan. 
you have some handouts at your, your table. So there is an article that was shared from, I think it's the 2010 at Leadership and Inconvenient Truth. You have an MSAN table tent that identifies the mission, values, goals, and core practices. Uh, then there is a, a staple packet that includes an overview of ways to use data to address equity issues. Um, part of the questions that came up in November were, were about accessing the data and, and you know, why we pick certain information. So you have examples of some of the data points that are being shared with our uh, teaching uh, staff at the building level. So I'm not going to walk through every piece with you, just want you to know that that's there as a reference. So the Minority Student Achievement Network, uh, more frequently referred to as just the acronym MSAN because the, the inclusion of the word minority, was established by a group of superintendents in 1999. Started with just, I think it was 14 superintendents who recognized the need to better understand and eliminate achievement and opportunity gaps that persisted in their schools. The, the network has grown from that original 14 to now 28 districts, um, and, and we are literally, as we come together, we come together three times a year, adding districts uh, each time that we are meeting. As Dr. Dixon already pointed out, we are a founding district. Um, so our superintendent at that time was one of the 14 that, that recognized <laughs> that our population was changing, that the needs of our students in our community was changing, and that we needed to, to have a greater um, focused effort on it. Just uh, from a, a personal standpoint, uh, back in 1999, like it was so long ago, I was actually a classroom teacher at Cleveland Heights High School. I taught mathematics <coughs> there. My Cleveland Heights and Shaker Heights co um, hosted the first student conference. So where our kids are here now reporting out about their experience in, in Michigan, we, along with Shaker Heights, were um, th the first districts to hold that, that student conference. My youngest sister was a participant in that student conference, and it's amazing the relationships and the conversations and the bonds that not only the, the adults form, but that the kids form, because they still keep in touch today. And, and that was an experience that she had at that time. She was a, um, a ninth grader. So it's really long lasting, very important relationships and things that, that happen as a part of that relationship. So the mission, when we meet uh, either as advisors or with the students, we take time out to go over the mission of the, the organization. And that is to understand and change school practices and structures that keep racial achievement gaps in place. Goal is to ensure racial differences in achievement are eliminated while improving the achievement of all students. So it's not eliminating the gap at the expense of one or more, but when our most struggling students achieve, everybody achieves. The organization then has an opportunity to truly be excellent. So we just want to we remind ourselves of that by going over it. The organizational structure, so again, you had the opportunity to hear from the students and learn about what their experiences are. When the, the network initially formed, though, there, there are two, uh, two groups that guide the overall network's agenda, and that is the governing board and the research practitioners council that we refer to just as our RPC members. So the superintendents serve as the members of the governing board and set the agenda for research and development. And then RPC members, there are usually two, sometimes more, from each one of the participating districts. Uh, and, and the roles and responsibilities of those who serve as RPC members varies. Uh, for Cleveland Heights University Heights, I serve as one of the RPC members, as do many other data or um, accountability directors do for their districts, as, as well as um, Dr. Octavia Reed. So her role here in the district, she serves as um, the coordinator for elementary, um, but we work hand in hand and then share the information that we learn with our, our, our teammates here. So when we talk about MSAN sets the agenda for 
um, research and development, there have been four consistent areas of focus that we work on. And so they're listed there. That's mathematics, literacy, student-teacher relationships, and conversations about race. Um, thanks to the participation of, our, our, of Dr. Reed, she says, you know, I never really realized that that was the focus of MSAN because publicly so much of what we shared has been a focus on the students. Understandably so, but there are, there are so many things that have been happening and, and come about in the district as a result of our participation. So, for example, we talk about student-teacher relationships. Cleveland Heights University Heights started using the AVID program, which is now in place at the middle schools as well as the high schools, because it was identified as a best practice for students of color uh, um, through MSAN or um, our use of scholastic reading inventory and read 180. Uh, connects to the literacy piece or our work with Agile Mind um, as a curricular tool was something shared to support students of color in the area of mathematics. Just last year, the RPC members at the direction of the governing board identified five working groups that they wanted to tackle in addition to those four areas of focus. So uh, the district's in involvement in, in MSAN signifies that we agree to engage in certain core practices. So on the table tents that you have, it outlines the, again, the, <coughs> the mission, the values, and those core practices. So we agree to, to look at and, and focus on certain things. First one, gathering and reporting disaggregated data. So I'm, I'm going to spend, um, once I go over this history, the rest of my time looking at some of those data points. We agreed to conduct evaluations of programs, again, with the focus on raising the academic achievement of students of color, um, conducting and participating in training and professional development for district staff um, relative to the MSAN mission, creating opportunities for students to guide the work of the organization, again, that connection to the, the student groups and the student conference, and then engaging in collaborative research. So to give you an example of what that, that looks like here in the district, so how have we engaged or what are some of the, the tools and, and resources that we've been able to um, strengthen or add? When we think about gathering data, uh, we use the student information system, Infinite Campus, to um, hopefully put the, put the data that we're reviewing in a user-friendly um, format. When we talk about adult, adult learning, the network provides um, free registration, so opportunities for staff to participate in what they refer to as mini conferences um, at least once a year. And we've referenced them before. We talked about them at the November meeting. We just recently went to um, a mini conference on uh, discipline disparities. That's where some of our work came from <coughs> related to uh, Dr. Ford. Uh, there was one in 2013 where the focus was on guidance counselors. So while most of the attention is placed on students and um, what's happening at the secondary level, that was a great opportunity to have a conversation K-12. So we, we brought in some um, representatives from the elementary level. Again, student opportunities. Uh, we have the student groups at both of the middle schools and the high school, their participation in the student conference, uh, and, and really trying to, to push and listen, because they share their voice with us, we just don't always listen to what it is that they feel like they need and what their, uh, what their questions and concerns and their, their hopes are. One of the most um, outstanding things that, I, that I've seen and, and been aware of to date is that like the ice cream social and giving kids the opportunity to say this is what it feels like for me to be a student of color in this honors class and and this is why it's difficult and these are the things that teachers have have done to help support my efforts and then there are still other things that that need to be gleaned from that um, and then research and professional development. So again, when we talked in November, there was the focus on Dr. Donna Ford and, and her equity allowance, but I don't want to lose sight that there are it's actually a phenomenal opportunity that we hear from several uh, of the you know latest and greatest researchers in the field or who have a focus on improving the, the circumstances, the situation for students of, of color, especially in the area of, of education. And so just highlighting some of the other people that we not only uh, reference their work in our decision making, but also have an opportunity to engage with them face to face and, and really question and talk with them about what they have seen um, in their work across the, the country. 
So that was my, what I hope was, brief yet clear and concise um, overview on our, our history and just give you some more information about MSAN. There is additional information that's available. So MSAN, the, the organization of the network itself, has its own website. If you do a Google search and you type in MSAN, it will go usually first to MSN, so you got to scroll down a little bit to, to find it. And it's also available, um, there's a link on the CHUH website under parents and students. So if you go there, it's spelled out Minority Student Achievement Network, you can get additional information, not just about the national organization, but about what's happening here, you know, with our middle schools and with our, our high school students. Now, so I, I set, yes, sir. Can I ask one thing about Absolutely. the first half there? Um, just a small thing, but when, when uh, folks attend the many conferences and you talked about the discipline disparities, how do we disseminate that information? I mean, so we go there, we get that, and then what practical effect does, do we see in our district? So we are working to try to share it in as many different ways and at many different times as we possibly can. And you know, having the opportunity to share here is one of those. The things that I'm providing with you, this, is, this wasn't newly created just for you. So these are things that we have used either through data retreats at the beginning of the, the school year in August that we have with members of our building leadership teams that we did a, a follow-up session with those um, individuals just in December, so going back and reviewing the data. Um, we meet regularly with our MSAN advisors, so they help make the connection not only um, to, to share with their colleagues, but then also to communicate that to the students. So we hear it come through sometimes um, in, in what they are sharing. So it's, it's, we try to share it whenever we have groups um, with us for professional development. Sometimes things are pushed out via email, um, but really the, the greatest focus is at those check-in times where we're looking at, excuse me, our overall district improvement plan. Did I answer your question, Eric? Okay. Any other questions? I'm sorry, I'll pause. Okay. <coughs> So, again, the, the, one of the major benefits of being in the network is that we have the opportunity, like as one of the students said, to learn and work with other people and districts who are in the same position as us. Um, there, one of our sister districts in Arlington, uh, Virginia, wrote a book actually called Gaining on the Gap that we reference quite frequently because it is the story of their work written by um, members of their school community. So it's actually referencing you know, their superintendent wrote a piece, parents wrote a piece, members of their um, teaching staff wrote a component. And, and in one of the earlier chapters, the superintendent shares that, you know, what they have learned over the years in engaging in um, work to close the achievement gap is that there are four key pieces that, that really need to be in place. You need to, to report the problem and, and show the data that goes along with it. So it doesn't do any good if I'm the, the, the keeper of that information. You have to work in every opportunity that you can to share it, even if it isn't um, the most positive, even if it doesn't necessarily put people in, in a, a, a great light when we think about what is the overall mission, it is to understand uh, the organizational barriers that can contribute to or, or keep us from being able to eliminate the gap. So that's an important and quite often one of the most difficult uh, points. The second thing is to measure and report progress consistently. So once you know and you begin to monitor that, inf you know, you begin to, to track it, are you sharing that and being honest about the progress that you're making? Making the goal of eliminating gaps a priority for everyone in the district. So uh, again, an aha is we're learning and sharing what we know with, you know, new members of our leadership team and just trying to expand um, the efforts is is that for a very long time the focus has been on the students. So it became the responsibility of just one or two people to do the, you know, quote unquote work. But we're we're never going to get where we need to be if it isn't a, a focused goal for everyone. And so that's teachers, students, custodians, bus drivers, board members, every parents, other community members who may not have children in the school, but understand this is what we're all about. Just as a side note, love that reference about the civility, um, the, the 
initiative. Initiative, thank you. That was talked about earlier because it, it, it was. I'm a <coughs> community member and, 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 it, and it was. So th that's the type of engagement and when we say making it a goal for everybody that really needs to be put into this work. And then um, the other point that they identified was once you become aware of it, then equal equitably distributing resources. You know, we know that uh, equ equ Equity doesn't necessarily mean everybody gets the same thing, but you are addressing the needs um, for the, the different buildings and the different topics that are discussed. So again, this evening, I'm just gonna focus on <coughs> that first part because quite often it is the most difficult one. It is the most difficult one and that is reporting the problem and the data disaggregating data by and, and in particular, disaggregating data by race and, and ethnicity. Um, the reason that we want to do that is because schools or organizations are then much better positioned to engage in discussions about the factors that contribute to those inequities. Um, and then not only are we better able to talk about it, but we can actually take actions that allow us to make changes. So. The next few slides, I just want to give you an example of how we have used data and how our learning from NSAN has helped us make adjustments. So at the close of the 2013-2014 school year, we saw that um, <coughs> about 37% of students K-12 received at least one disciplinary referral. Um, when we looked at the top infractions, we saw that the top three reasons for those referrals were failure to comply, disruption, and truancy. And those terms uh, come from our actual, what we refer to as our code of conduct. And then you have the um, adult responses to that. So when, we, when students receive a referral, there are a, a, a gamut of different responses that adults can use. Our top three for last school year were alternative learning environment, which um, students are removed from the classroom. They still have the support of uh, a staff member to do their work, but they are not in, in the traditional classroom setting. We have extended detention and then suspension. So, you know, most often we would stop here. Like, this is enough. This is something that we definitely need to work on, we need to address. But what, because of our connection to MSAN, we've started to not just stop there, but then disaggregate the information even further to see if we can identify factors that contribute to, um, to, that, to that data point. So again, we, we talked about it before. It was one of the goals as part of our 14-15 um, improvement plan. And looking at, so when we look at suspensions, what does, what does the data tell us? And we see that black students make up 73% of the total district population and 93% of the um, suspensions. So again, translating that, what does that mean? And so one of the, the pieces of learning that we got from that Discipline Disparities Conference is that you can look at different measures, and that's referenced for you in your, on your beige colored sheets there for using data to address equity. It, what it comes down to is that one out of every black students is likely to be suspended. So that, that was why we put that, the goal into our improvement plan. The, the missing in, instructional time um, certainly is, is extremely important in one thing, but in, in, a, in a bigger picture is what does that tell us about the, um, <coughs> what our students are feeling and what they're experiencing on um, a, a regular basis. So a need to drill down and, and look even further beyond just the initial numbers. Show you a, a, another data point that we, we look at, because it's not solely focused on discipline, we've also looked at academic performance and also gifted population. So black students make up 73% of the total district population and 38% um, of the gifted population. We look a little bit further, that means that the likelihood of students being identified uh, of black students being identified as gifted to 7%. Um, and the index or risk index for white students is 42%. And you can even hear me pausing. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I wanna clarify why this is. 
I'm a student, I was a student here. I went through our schools. I know we have outstanding staff. So this is an, an great support. And you've seen and heard from our kids just this evening and you know how outstanding that, that they are. This is what makes the first point of reporting the, the, the problem and the data that goes along with it so challenging. It's a national challenge, so much so that we have 27 other districts who are looking to work together to learn and work to say, how does this happen when you have all of these wonderful people, you have these resources, you, you are working so hard in so many levels, but we still see these gaps. Um, it, it just makes one, it's difficult to share, but it, it shows why our participation in this and, and, and being open and honest about it is so critical. Because, because again, until we do that, we're, we are, are not going to be able to um, reach the level of excellence that, that we know we're all capable of. Skip that one. So again, just kind of, um, I hope is bringing it together and, and connecting to what I just said, when we think that the mission of MSAN and CHUA is to understand and, and um, change school practices and structures that keep racial achievement gaps in place, walking through these steps with the first point being, you know, report the problem and the data and, and measure and report the progress, make this goal a goal for everyone in the organization, and then make sure that we are aligning our resources and distributing them to, to meet those needs. Like, what a, what a night to share this part. <coughs> but I, I, so in your, in your takeaway, um, as we think about how this all fits together, I'd, I'd like you to remember, and again, my teammates would like you to remember, that eliminating the gap requires deep, deep examination of our data and then the reflection of adult values, beliefs, expectations, and, and behaviors. We reference a lot when we talk professional development activities and we read this article or we did this, read this book together. Um, we'd also like you to remember that there's no single thing that will serve as the panacea for improving academic performance and eliminating the gaps. And that by having a focus on eliminating um, achievement and opportunity gaps and, and working to best meet the needs of um, our, our minority students, that when we, when we do that, the entire organization will be excellent in, in every possible measure. And, and so I remember in the November meeting, one of the, the charges was, we know that the, the state focuses on test scores, and so when we talk about data, that's often the, the one thing that we focus on. And again, having had the opportunity to hear from our, our kids and, and knowing what happens in our buildings every day, we know that there's a lot. Um, there are some unbelievable, really fantastic things that are, are going on. Um, and you know, those things are appreciated, and there's still work to do. I'm going to open it up for questions. Why not? I'm the one who can't talk, I so I'll just keep asking questions. Okay. Um, one, one of your slides when you were talking about the, um, the uh, uh, you had the three top things that, that, uh, that had come up and then what the results were, what the, uh, uh, not cure. Adult so, reaction. The adult responses. Top three responses, thank you. I'm sorry, I have apologies. I'm a little um, Do you ever, do we also analyze the outcome of those responses? So in other words, we here's our response to it. How well did that work for us? And, and because it seems to me that part of the whole thing is that, you know, you, you'll have infractions. And I'm, I'm using this example as a, an example of a larger thing. So you, so you have, you have an infraction, you have an, uh, uh, something that happened, and then you have a response to that. But fine, but do we ever analyze how well that response works, not just in terms of the original issue, but also in terms of the greater picture? Which so like, is do we see students who um, were referred for a particular infraction, they received their, their consequence or the, the response, did they uh, engage in the behavior a, a, again or right. well that's one part of it and then the other part is I mean from my standpoint everything that happens is an opportunity right so so you're you you can look at it as it is it does it happen again but you could also say or did we find a way to to meet that student's needs 
because maybe the, the reason the infraction happened in the first place is we weren't meeting that student's needs well enough. So do, how, how deeply do we analyze what really the way we, uh, the way we address problems? <coughs> so by taking the time to, to look at it in the various ways, it, it, you know, when we think about the reason that we report the data and, and want to disaggregate it or, or, or look at the, the underlying factors behind it, is that it does put us in a position to be able to describe what's going on and to be in a better position to respond to questions like that. There isn't, um, there isn't a, a tool that we're currently using that I could quantify that for you, but when we take a look at the building plans that came out as a result of the, the district plan and the focus on uh, reducing the number of referrals, you do see more, uh, you, you see buildings looking to respond in a, in a different way or to track to see how those responses are working. For example, we have a, a, a waiver day, a, a time to meet with teachers next Friday. And at the elementary level, they are going to take some time to look at um, CHAMPS, which is referred to, which is a uh, classroom management program. So uh, again, what steps can be taken? What kind of structures can we build in between the teacher and the, the class before it even gets to the, the referral piece that allows us to reduce those, right. those numbers? So by, by reporting it, providing people with the data, giving them a chance to see the aha, we're able to now talk through the how's that working for you, and here are some of the other supports or interventions that we might want to try that may uh, elicit better results. Okay. Thank you. I have a uh, couple questions. Yes, Basically, sir. and they're all data questions. Um, the handout you gave us here, uh, how far back can you pull out data to show us uh, longitudinal trends. I mean, the report we got last year only had like the last five years of data from the ODE, uh, Department of Education. How far back can we go? Because I'm cur I'm really curious about trends. In particular, there was something that where we we have a disparity, which we had disparity in the uh, based on our cohorts for the last 30 years. <coughs> but in the last three years, we saw our overall gifted enrollment, both demographic cohorts, decline by almost one half. So I'm curious as to why both of our dem both cohorts we've seen a decline in our gifted enrollment. In the meantime, I'm curious to see the trend more than just last five years. So I'd be curious to see how far back we have internal data. The more details, the more. I don't, I don't have a problem with how deep you go in because I'm curious to see the longitudinal trends. And the second one would be where is our, we have a disparity uh, based upon our, our, our demographic balance. The question I would pose is what about the other MSN districts? Are, are we typical or atypical? Because if we're typical, then we're all in the same boat. If we're atypical, then what's going on? What are they doing that we're not? Because that, that, I'd be very curious to see where, if they're seeing the same uh, demographic imbalance in their gifted enrollments, because I think that's, I'm very curious <coughs> to see about that. Because okay. I want to know if it's something systemic and internal with us, or if it's a, uh, a broader trend. I, I can address what one district I know is doing. They got rid of the word gifted from their programs. So they just took that label off and, and went with uh, providing um, enrichment programs for their students uh, pre-K-12. And when they did that, they saw an increased enrollment in their students' uh, being in those in, enhanced and advancement class rather than label gifted. So, you know, that was one example, but sometimes taking off the labels in which people have the perceptions of sorting kids. Um, that, was, that was an example I learned in, in one of my governing meetings. It's, I mean, for, to me, it's like I re if, if we're the outlier, then, hey, what's the, the folks who don't have this kind of disparity, what are they doing that we're not? Conversely, if we're... Uh, in the middle of the pack, then we're, mm -hmm. we got to try everything. But mm -hmm. I'm very curious to see how we compare to uh, sy systems with a, a comparable demographic breakdown because I'm, 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 I want to see where, how we compare. I mean, it, you know, as much as, you know, I'm not afraid of the numbers because I know when we were a uh, 55-45 uh, minority Shaking to history. white district sitting in mm -hmm. classes where we had three or four minority students. So we've always had, to a degree, a disparity it, we're, we've we've improved, but not to where we want to be. And I'm curious to see uh, longitudinally how that is. 
um, as well, like I said, the peer districts, especially the MSN districts, you know, what's going on? How, are, are we an outlier or not? Okay. So to answer your first question, how far can we go back internally with data? So not going back to the ODE website or the Ohio Department of Education website where the, Dr. Willis pulled that initial information. We transitioned from one student information system to another uh, in 2000, I believe it was 2010, 11, so I can go back that far, um, and we would be able to put together some of the views that are contained in your in your beige packet. The Your, your second question about, well, how do we compare? So addressing the, the gap or looking at those gaps is a, is a national challenge. It's why when we have our state testing, there there's the gap closing component where we look at now it's called annual measure annual measurable objectives where we look at subgroup performance and, and before we switched to um, the ESEA waiver and we were under no child left behind, it was AYP and adequate yearly pro um, progress where we still looked at subgroup performance. So uh, the reason it's a, it's a one of the reasons it's a, it's a hot topic is because we, we as educators, we see that gap. You also see it in your community in terms of um, income earned, uh, you know, um, uh, our, our health care, and you know, so so you see it in, in different. You see the, the the gap or the disparities between um, racial groups in different ways in different environments. When we talk about how, how do we compare within the MSAN uh, network? Well, we're all in MSAN for the same reason, and our, and our populations vary. Again, going back to one of the comments that the student made, she goes, you know, I, um, that 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 notion of. You, we think about diversity in one way, but then when I talk to students from Prairie View or I talk to students in um, you know, Washington State, who they interact with and what they work on is, is, is very different. I went back to this, the research and development page because we have not been um, openly sharing our statistics as it relates to discipline disparity. So we, as, a, as a network, we haven't been collectively um, pulling that information. But last year, we said, we need to come back. We need to do that. So I, I don't, I can't share with it. I don't have anything to share with you from the network perspective in terms of how do we compare, but it is a focus of those working groups. So again, and then not just looking at discipline disparities or that kind of data, but then also what are our hiring practices when we talk about role modeling and, and who's working with our kids, whether it's in the curricular format or in extracurriculars, you know, what, what is that type of, of balance? So it, for your second question, I'm not 100% how we compare. I can't provide you with that data piece, but it is something that the network is looking at. Well, yeah, because I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I know the MSN districts, is, um, there's, it's all a matter of what the definition of diversity is. I'm, I'm viewing it as, okay, Alexandria, Virginia, uh, Shaker Heights, mm -hmm. Euclid, uh, South Euclid, Lyndhurst. I mean, very systems that very similar number of capacities. I'd be very curious to see are they have are they have the exact same disparity or is it different? And if it's in, if, if if it's very different, I'd be very curious to see, you know, what are they what are they doing right that we're not? Because this is this has been an issue we've had systemically and chronically for 30 years, so it's not a new issue for us, which is why we're at MSAM. One of the good things Mason did, um, but the issue, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what are best practices. If someone's got a a better mousetrap that seems to be working, what is it? And how, do, how can we, uh, you know, great artists copy? How can we knock it off? Exactly. Um, I did go back here because you you mentioned some of like what you would consider to be those light districts districts, and we know the those that are um, participating. But again, Shaker Heights, is our neighbor, looks like us, so we do work with them on a regular basis. But it's definitely something we can keep in mind and, and work to share with you on a regular basis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> Luckily, we okay. got through item D on the agenda. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've also already taken care of E. I think we probably have, if I'm judging this correctly, maybe 15 more minutes or 20 more minutes on the agenda. Um, so we'll take, we'll move forward on business services. Um, I need a motion to approve item F1, the donations. So move. Any questions, comments? 
Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Coble. Yes. Ms. Pepler. Yes. Mr. Register. Yes. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Mr. Zucker. Yes. I need a motion to approve the um, quarterly contracts that are listed in your agenda. So moved. Second. Questions, comments? Mr. Gaynor? Ms. Pepler. Yes. Mr. Register. Yes. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Mr. Coble. Yes. Okay. In um, finance, Scott, which of these can we take together? We can together? take all those together. For okay. Can I have a motion to approve items G1 through 4? So moved. Second. Questions? Uh, Mr. Gaynor, any comments on the nice do giant document? Or this? I'm sorry. Never mind. We're, I'm jumping ahead. Yeah, you're jumping ahead. <laughs> I will um, I will just mention on this one that um, the resolution three you've never seen before that's something that um, the auditor state that came out of the current year audit that they want us to place a limitation on blanket purchase orders so and we only have um, one that gets even closer to that <coughs> and it's one of the health care providers so but that's that's something that's new that you would never have seen before the others are um, are standard okay mr. Gaynor mr. register Yes. Mr. Silverman? Yes. Mr. Zucker? Yes. Mr. Coble? Yes. Ms. Pepler? Yes. Okay, moving on to the board president's report. As, as um, unusual in one way as this meeting was, I, I really um, look forward to this year and, um, and appreciate your support. I look forward to us um, continuing to make progress on the facilities master plan and um, the and making our case to the community about the operating levy that we've already begun to discuss um, and I um, as as much as as I said this that some of what we heard this evening might have been difficult I very much welcome um, that community members are engaged are passionate and want to come and and share that um, with us so that's it for my board president's report for tonight um, okay, do we have any unfinished business? I know we have a couple of items of new business. So I'm going to let people decide whether we do this tonight or not since it's been a long meeting. But um, Ron Register and I were approached by the Heights Community Congress um, regarding yes, um, a concern of theirs. Do you want, should I cover Go ahead, tonight? Go that's fine. We, should I cover tonight or do you want to do this at another meeting? It's up to you completely. Well, well it, I don't think it should be up to me. I guess my question would, would be more, is it something that if your voice can't allow it, we should put it off for the other meeting unless Ron can make a, can, a remarks can, on it. I, I just can, think no, no, asking. No, no. I, I, mean, I, I think it's on the correspondence and announcements. Okay. That's fine. And we ought to just let be informed the rest of the board. Okay, that's fine. So I'll do it then. Okay. And it may be something else later. Okay, that's fine. So I have no other new business person. I okay. Sure something else. We do have two <coughs> items. <coughs> um, and I know that the one um, is, which should we do first? Doesn't have, matter. Um, the Millican, so the two resolutions that uh, okay. are relative to that. So the extension and the acceptance. So, so first we um, want to discuss the um, extension, a, a possible extension of the um, agreement to sell the Millican property. And I know, Mr. Shergalis, you were going to come in and bring some background on this for us to consider. So good evening. Um, briefly, um, one of the conting contingencies was that we would be able to obtain uh, access easement for uh, the remaining parcel after we <coughs> sell the lower parcel to uh, Mosdos. And uh, in negotiations with the uh, medical office building, uh, who has stepped forward to uh, work with us to develop an, an easement through their property to the severance access drive um, we discovered that um, a a portion of the property that we already have an existing easement on and that we were going to use as access to get to the medical office building property uh, is not an access easement it's only a 
water and gas line easement. So we did not have the rights to dri drive over it. However, through the work that the uh, team did in uh, investigating this issue, they discovered that that easement parcel, and um, I did bring a drawing so you can kind of see it real quick. Um, that easement parcel is, it's actually, uh, <coughs> we're able to, the owner of that parcel is willing to deed that to the school district. So we would no so longer the need this, it, it as an easement. Right, it would become, property. it would become right. part of our property. And there's a lot of advantages to that because it would give us uh, uh, access to Crest Road through our own property forevermore. Even though that's not our preferred way to get out, we would prefer to still obtain an easement through the medical office building and have access that way. Um, at some future time, we still own that parcel now. And um, so there's some advantages to us. The cost is minimal, and uh, there's really only upsides to that. So, so that's that, the purple? Yes, it's the purple piece on this drawing. Um, we've, we have had an easement for water and sewer over that parcel of property for years. Um, we thought we had an accident e easement. It, it did turn out that way. And now we're able to actually obtain that from the owner of that parcel. They're willing to deed it over to us so that we can own and it. And so once we learn this, it's going to take us and our attorneys some right. time to all get this. All of this, all of this, yeah. what I've just described has kind of delayed the process a little right. bit. And we think there is a chance that we can still make the closing. Right. But we really would like, just in case, for the board, and that's the action we're asking for, to grant the treasurer and the board president the authority to extend the closing date. 30 days. At no more than... I think there's actually a date in the resolution. Yeah, it's January, January 16th. Or February 18th. I think it's February 18th, which is actually 33 days. <laughs> um, that was the original. Did you call Have it? we communicated our intent to most of those? Scott, I don't know. Oh, okay. Has Kathy had any conversation? Yeah, I, legal counsel, uh, most of us is aware of the that's, that's right. issue. Yes, she has yes. communicated that to Alan. And they don't have any... They don't no, and in fact, um, part of the part of the issue. So you have these two uh, resolutions that legal counsel sent. One is um, authorizing the possible extension. The other is accepting this deeded property. Right. Um, if we can't title uh, transfer the title, according to Kathy, because if we were to do that, and we don't have an eas easement, and this is landlocked property, most dose would have to allow us access to the property through Milliken. And so they will not transfer. They, they will the, not. The county engineer's the office won't won't it. record the. Yeah. So well, part of the issue is that they're aware of it because they won't allow the deal to go through until this is resolved. And also the county, uh, the the one holdup is the county is trying to resolve this because they actually, and I think this was part of the issue and the confusion initially, had that had this easement as being owned already by us, half by us and half by the post office. That's right. So there were issues at the county level. Okay. And so Squires is working with them to uh, <coughs> expedite this, and they think that they, we will still meet the, uh, the deadline next Friday. But in the event that we're not, um, they want to make sure that we have the ability to have the extension and also that the board has agreed to accept the deeded property because that has to happen before they, the property transfers title. That's it. Did you color this? I know, I did a good so, job. Right? I was a very good. So is this I, I didn't, two, actually. Oh, we okay. need to I take it two separate, separate actions. Resolution. Yes. Okay. Yes. So can I have a, a motion to accept the resolution to extend the agreement? Um, and then if people have other questions, I should have taken that motion first. Questions people have other questions? Second. Okay. Other questions? Uh, yeah, my question is okay. when are we going to figure out what we're going to do with the money? Uh, <laughs> from the so same. So yeah. Well, we're going to... Uh, a while back, I had some suggestions and ideas as far as the disposition of the $650,000 in the sale of Milliken, and I'd like us to 
come up with some commitment as opposed to just sitting out there in the air. I think there's, uh, I spoke with, with Mr. Coble after the last meeting in regard to this, had some, he, he challenged me to come up with some ideas. I came up with some, uh, some new ideas, additional ideas, I should say. I think if we can uh, commit those funds to some of those ideas, if, there's, if they have traction, then that could help our design team with uh, what they're planning to do with the high school. If that is what we were going, that's uh, a nice chunk of change that they could be then uh, reallocating. So uh, my, my request to my colleagues would be that sometime in the next month or so, at one of our meetings that we come to some conclusion Have that this. conversation. Yeah. I, I think that's a reasonable request, Eric. I think that we should wait until we ha right. this is a done deal. It's not worth it for us to spend time doing it, but I think I appreciate that you raised it again. Any other questions on, or comments on this one? Okay, Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Mr. Coble. Yes. Ms. Pepler. Yes. Mr. Register. Yes. Okay, so I now need a motion to approve the um, our acceptance of title and approval of the quick claim deed. So moved. Second. Questions, comments? The only comment I would make is that this easement is part of the original Severance Estate. So this at this road's actually been there for close to 100 years. So this is really this isn't anything new. It's basically it's been there. <coughs> it was an access road for the Severance Estate back in the day. Uh, so it's not like we're paving anything new. Anything else? Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Mr. Coble. Yes. Ms. Pepler. Yes. Mr. Register. Yes. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Okay. And we have one more item of new business, and that is a, a resolution um, related to the operating levy um, that um, we will need to put on the ballot during this calendar year. Yes. So. And we have uh, Squires, again, as our, our legal counsel, prepared the resolution. This is the first reading that's required. Um, the millage is, has been left blank, as you can see. So um, as, as the board adopts this resolution, if you choose to do that tonight, we would, we would have to designate the millage that will go herein. Um, and just so everyone's aware of the deadlines that are set forth, for a May um, 5th election, we would need two readings by the board. This first reading authorizes me to um, go to the county and, and have them certify the amount of money that we would receive from the levy. It doesn't obligate the district to necessarily move forward with the levy. So if, for example, you were to choose to do this and then subsequently decide for some reason that you, you didn't want to move forward, <coughs> you would just never do the second resolution. Then the second resolution is required before February 5th that um, uh, would then authorize me to take it to the uh, Board of Elections and have it placed on the May 5th, val May 5th ballot. Um, and we would expect that that would then happen at the January 20th board meeting. And we wouldn't have, on this resolution, we wouldn't specify. We you will not specify millage, yes. Tonight? Yes. Correct. Okay. And, and just, I won't take a lot of time. We'll obviously be talking about this. But the reason that this board is um, needing to move this up or at least put us in the position that we can make the decision to move this up um, from a typical November election is that the the city of Cleveland Heights has um, made it clear that they will be going to the voters at some point prob in November I, at the November election for a either property or income tax um, and and we are not um, we have been advised that it's not um, <coughs> it's not advisable for us to go on the ballot at the same time and you know we've we've done a great job of stretching this yet again to four years but um, our treasurer has has and, and our superintendent have said that it, it's it's not possible for us to stretch it to five years um, and and if for some reason we were able to make huge cuts to get us to five years, the millage in 2016 would be so high that this community could not handle it. So we'll we'll be talking about this more, but um, just want to explain something that is out of the ordinary for this community for us to be talking about this for 
for a special election. And we also had a recommendation from the late finance I was just going to mention that I think that's where we should start the yeah. conversation. Yes. So the late finance committee, um, we read their report at the last meeting, and they um, both verified the need for the levy by reviewing five year, reviewing the five-year forecast, but um, also set their recommendation at 6.1 mils. And there was some conversation at that time that um, could we get the, the millage under six, and the superintendent and I um, both committed that we would make the reductions necessary if the board chose to take that millage to five nine, um, and and so five we've, we've five nine. So we've we've targeted um, five hundred thousand dollars in in savings from the next fiscal year budget that would be a permanent reduction that would bring the millage down under six mils. I'm all for. I'm at, I'm in favor of what we did, but I'm just I'm a little hesitant about voting on something, you know, at 10 to 10, I, 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 I don't say I want a dog and pony show, but I, you know, I'd like to have the civilian, the late, fi the late, late finance committee, pre I mean, we got the report, but I'm just, I'd rather we have a, an actual, hey, here's a, or some more data than just we got a report. I'm, I know there's the need, but I want the, I don't want to say the theater of it, but I'd like to have a more of a presentation than doing it at 10 o'clock on a, Tuesday. But if we could get this done by 11 to 10, would you do it then? No, no, no. You're, you're missing my no, point. He's, he's, he's I know kidding. What, kidding. What, but, but what are you at? Well, I, I, you're not asking for anything from the Life Finance Committee. No, I'd, I'd, someone, okay. at, I'd, someone at the microphone, at, you know, I'd like, I'd, I'd, I think there's, there's more validity, in my opinion, even though it's Jane's comments, to have members of the Life Finance Committee address the board as to the need. Um, I just, I, I, I hate doing this at Ten o'clock at night. Well, th they did. A, yeah. They did last at the last meeting, and but be, and because Jane wasn't able to be here, right, Scott I, read right. the report. Um, I'd like a better sense of what the the cuts are we're proposing. Those I, that's I just that's my only. I understand that we there we, we we're playing beat the clock. I understand that. Yeah. And we're and it's it's a fait complete. I don't say it's a fait complete. It's highly likely we're going to do it. I just to me there's a there's a certain protocol and I just hate to, oh one more item we're putting an issue on the ballot I mean we're sandwiched in between a number of other tax issues I think we need to give it a little more gravitas that's just me I'm sorry I just feel that way I'm not sure that I need to know more about the exact cuts I think that if the superintendent and the treasurer have said that they can do it I believe they can do it well and, and that's kind of it's I'm sorry Ron I'm sorry. Yeah, that's kind of where I am. I, I could, I could move forward with their word. I uh, might I suggest a, a a compromise because I understand what you're saying, Eric. But I I do, but because of the timing of this, we would be required to hold a special an, another meeting. Yeah. And so because this requires two readings, um, uh, if I could suggest that, but before the next reading that we have some more detail from the administration um, on, on that, on the level of, of or on the types of reductions that you're already looking at to help us get to 5-9. And, um, and then that will be before our second, our yeah, second if, vote. If we get a and then, I, I'm not yeah. sure I agree with you that we need Jane to come well, back, but if you want her to, I'm sure she would for well, the next meeting. There, I mean, she's not the only member of the committee. I'm just, I'm just saying is that I think that before we embark on something as big as this, and that's going to have an impact on people's lives, that we need, it's, it's got to be more than just, oh, okay, yeah, boom. I think, you know, if we, if we can have that at the second reading, I'd be happy with that. Okay. And I, I, I understand Eric's point and, and mm -hmm. support it, so I think your compromise is a good compromise. Um, I would just ask Dr. Dixon, I, no offense, Scott, but I, I, just to hear from you, going to a 5.9 mil levy, and I just want to hear your comfort level with that. I'm comfortable with it. We have, we've identified the potential cuts. Um, I've spoken with Cabinet. Um, and we believe that we can get those cuts just in some, without touching um, classrooms and students, um, that there's some other areas that we can make some, some financial cuts. And in terms of the, the, the overall 
plan for the district, for the, the educational plan for the district, the the integrity of the plan, you right. feel that if we went to a 5.9 mil levy, levy, that would not in any way negatively impact the plans you have for moving forward? No, I, I don't believe it will. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm confident in 5.9. Okay. Yeah. And Scott, I'm sorry, remind me, you <coughs> said the second <coughs> reading would be which day? <coughs> January 20th. And are you, the two of you comfortable that you can bring us back some more detail at the January 20th meeting yeah. for? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we can, and I can also um, ask Jane, I, and we'd, we'd asked her as the chair, and she's the one who prepared the report, but if she's unavailable on the 20th, we can have another member of the committee okay. come forward and, and report out. Mm -hmm. Is it just uh, a majority vote? Yes, for this, uh, it's a majority vote. For the second reading that actually places on the ballot, it's a supermajority. So we would it's what? Supermajority super for four. the second reading. Three for this vote, but four for the second. Okay. Uh, I want to acknowledge that I won't be here for the second reading, so there's only... Everybody. So we need huh? a, we'll, need the, we'll need all, all, we need all four to vote affirmatively. affirmatively. You need to do what? We'll have, we'll have to have everyone no, present None of us can get sick, then. We got to look at the typhoid Mary over yeah. there to make sure uh, we're okay. <laughs> well, he's here now. <laughs> yeah, I'm here now. It's, all the, it's all the rest of you who will be here. So <laughs> I'm going to attempt to move this along. Can I have a motion to approve the resolution to place a 5.9 mil levy on the ballot? The way this reads is on the May 6th ballot. Um, but, Scott, you've explained that that, that can be... Mm -hmm. um, changed um can i have a motion to approve that so move second any further discussion i just want to clarify what you just said because i think i understood scott correctly that it can be it says may 6th right it can be changed i'm sorry that's right it can be what it can be changed to not for us to not we can decide to not, to not do it, it. Choose right. not it cannot be yes. changed to another date an yeah, earlier date reading. right we could can right, it be that changed to a later date on a second reading oh no no, no i don't no, think that so i think it need, you're right so you're right. i think it needs to be a new resolution you're right it would be a new resolution yeah. to change yeah. to another date you're right thank you that was my only point okay mr gainer mr coble yes Ms. Pepler? Yes. Mr. Register? Yes. Mr. Silverman? Yes. Mr. Zucker? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, board committee reports. I've got a bunch of stuff <laughs> that we deferred it from last one, so I can go through it real quick. All right, uh, the Alumni Foundation's cocktail party back in November, well attended, uh, despite the snowstorm, uh, which was the most snow we've had since, and no, we've had no snow since then. Uh, the next HeightsGear.com <coughs> sale is the last Saturday in January. Uh, you can find some wonderful custom, there's a promotional stuff out in the counter. We used uh, Angie's logo for the facilities project on that. Um, the Alumni Foundation is going to be working with the school district in Zorba in the back. We're uh, hopefully going to be partnering with uh, some of the kids at the high school to build a scale Lego model of the high school. So the idea being, hopefully, uh, to have it ready by groundbreaking. Um, it's going to be big. So it's going to be expensive. So if you've got extra Legos, send them on in. Um, but the idea the color is, doesn't matter. Well, for the interior structure, it won't matter. But the idea being between the size of it, it's going to need an engineer, uh, engineering a structure in the interior. You've got to figure budget. So it really will be a great exercise for the kids, uh, comparable. And we hope to rope in our, uh, some of our, our architectural firms and, and Regency as well. Um, the Alumni Foundation Pancake Breakfast is in April. We've got the Hall of Fame coming up, scholarships as well. Um, and non-alumni, the Facilities Accountability Committee continues to meet. Um, they're moving forward. They're, they seem to be uh, generally pretty happy with stuff that's been going on. So I think the uh, Nancy was at the last meeting. Um, I think their next meeting is going to probably come in the next couple of weeks. But uh, they're meeting regularly, uh, asking a lot of questions. And also uh, their meetings also run very long as well. Not this long. No, uh, close. So Anyone uh, else? Not immediately. Nope. Okay, correspondence and announcements. Okay, I'm going to try this now. Um, and I'll, I, can, I can make it sort of quick. Uh, so, so Heights Community Congress contacted 
Ron Register and I regarding some concerns they had because they had been contacted by residents um, regarding the impact of, of school rating systems on buying and selling homes in the district. So I'm, I want to be really honest and say that I approached this not knowing where we were headed with this. Um, but it was very productive and they've done quite a bit of work. Um, what, what they started doing in research on, the, on websites like Zillow and, and, and finding out these online rating systems and, and, and some of the fallacies of the online rating systems and, and how this is negatively impacting, the, again, the, the housing market and the community and home values for that matter. So they sort of went into it and they, they realized at some point that they wanted to, first of all, ensure that we as a board were aware of all this, but then they also didn't, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, they also did not want to go too far without soliciting our advice and, and expertise because they wanted to, they felt this was in, really important to, for the school district to be aware of what they were doing. So I think ultimately, and Ron, feel free to, to correct me, but um, I think their notion is to in some way partner with the district to sort of override the injustice that, that is being uh, done. I, I should tell you, they, as part of the thing, this is not directly related, but they, they did this study racial disparities in the Cleveland suburban home sales market from 2008 to 2012. It's a really good study. I mean, they, they, they've got some talent um, working forward. So the bottom line is, um, so, you know, what's the next thing to do? I think they just wanted to find out. They sort of asked us what, what they should do, and we said the best thing we can do is bring this back to the board to let them know, let you guys know what's going on, what they're trying to do. Um, and then in terms of next steps, we really didn't try and get there, and I'm not even trying to get there tonight. It's more a matter of if, if there's interest on the board, Ron and I can contact back and we can talk about should they make contact with the administration, should, should they come to a board meeting, whatever. But uh, we just want to make sure you're aware of the conversation. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's comparable to the, uh, the, the group that was doing stuff in regards to uh, standardized testing. It's the same thing where you have a, uh, a generic metric that doesn't look at detail. So I, I would say whatever support we can give them, I would I'm well, cool with that. They even went as far as to talk about the, the collaborations or the, the affiliations is a better word, that the this particular group that they were studying had with either the housing market or the realtor market or, or and also the, the reliance on the testing and how it didn't seem to co correlate. They had actually done some good initial work. But again, they, they basically said, we don't know exactly how to handle this. We want you to help us to, to figure right. out. So, so I just, I we just only, want to bring it to you guys to understand. The only thing I would add it. is uh, that there seems to be a nationwide, this seems to be a nationwide yeah. thing. Thanks, Ron. And that it seems <laughs> to be bad by some of the uh, charter school supporters, known charter school supporters. So it's almost taking the report card and seeing that they're, rate, they're actually rating communities based on the report card and livability. So it's kind of an interest, interesting way they're going about it. And I think the next step really is for us to look at them to come and make a presentation to us. And, and just not to step on Angie's toes at all. I mean, we also discussed the notion of where we don't want to let other people tell our story for us. And I mean that our, not just our, the school districts, but our, the, commu the community's story. So um, how do you, how do we create a, a, the story that, that is really what's happening? So anyway, that's, that's my report. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. At one minute af after 10. Scott, do you have oh. any comment? You have this giant book that looks very impressive. Is oh. there anything you want to? <laughs> yeah, don't Thank forget you. that. Um, just that we've, we've prepared the CAFR, um, and the audit is complete. The CAFR for the year ended June 30, 2014 is here for your reading pleasure. Lots of nice artwork in there, student artwork. There is, actually. It will be um, on the district website by the end of the week. So um, we just want to thank everyone who was involved with that, particularly um, Angie's department. They do a nice job of helping us get this laid out and, and the student artwork and everything that's in there. And then, um, of course, my staff and actually a lot of the other departments, too, with statistical data that we have to provide. So, And the cities um, also provide data for us, too. So it's a, it's a good document. It's very lengthy, but it does have some good information. So I'd encourage everyone to check it out.
Thank you. So now at two minutes after 10, can I have a motion to, so to adjourn? Okay. Second. <laughs> Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Coble. Yes. Mr. Pepler. Yes. Mr. Register. Yes. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Mr. Zimmerman.